Hello everyone, I'm Maciej Kuchara and this is Art Cafe episode 117. For this episode I invited Lois Van Barrel. Lois is an incredibly talented freelance illustrator and character designer from Utrecht, Netherlands. She is also one of the most popular illustrators on social media, with her Instagram account breaking almost 2 million followers. We spoke about her career in character design for video games and animation, as well as her incredible growth in popularity on social media and how it's affecting her work and growth as an artist. It goes without saying that I'm super excited about this episode. Hope you're going to enjoy it as much as I did. And let's go! Like career-wise, things have been okay, definitely. Like I have Patreon. Um, I'm super lucky to have patrons, and I have. Um, I was able to like kind of fill up the canceled workshops and events with more client work because mm-hmm. I'm working on a couple of ongoing projects. So, and and I just the main adjustment has been working from home, which hasn't been like a huge adjustment. It's, it's right. so that's hasn't been such a big deal for me personally. But um, mentally, it's been really hard for me because I was like really terrified when it started, when I started to realize how dangerous it is. And I have a lot of anxiety and I actually didn't even realize how much anxiety I have until this whole thing happened. (laughs) And then I found out that I have like such bad, like all these things that, you know, like health anxiety, like I'm scared that I'm going to get it. Or I'm always asking my boyfriend like 80 times a day, like every time he (laughs) clears his throat, I'm like, okay, how's your temperature? Okay. How's your breathing? Okay. Jump up. Is your energy level? Okay. You know, I'm like so obsessive about it and calling my grandparents all the time. Like I'm really worried that something bad is going to happen to people that I love. So that's, that's been the biggest challenge for me, like the mental health aspect of it. Um, but I've, I, I have, my techniques I, I'm starting to get it under control a little more but it was a rough couple of weeks in the beginning like all I did when I first realized how bad the situation was was just like scroll and uh, scroll the news and like take in one <laughs> bad message after the next so big big mistake <laughs> yeah like I finally managed to like kind of start focusing on some other stuff but for a while I felt like that's the only thing I could think about yeah yeah I, I, I did the same in the beginning, uh, just, just, you know, it's natural, you kind of want to learn what's going on and get informed, but news tend to kind of, kind of like clickbait you into reading horrible stuff. Yeah. And, yeah. um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I think it was an article that I've read, um, about person who got sick in Florida and came back to, to LA. And it was a young person, 34 or something, and, and that person unfortunately died. And it was like, oh, that's horrible. And, and you know, it's not a fun piece of news to read to start your day. <laughs> yeah, that um, stuff has been nestling in my brain, like the yeah. young people dying. It's, it's also awful when old people die, and that also nestles in my brain. But just the unpredictability of it yeah, is... Yeah it's awful but the, but the part that was like that kind of get me oh okay i see what you guys are doing was that oh this person just recovered from cancer and this person right. had like some really heavily underlying conditions yeah. and obviously all of that is horrible and i don't wish anyone to to go through any of that but it was like why would you omit that news you know why would you why would you do that and then i realized oh okay you know that's you're making money that's that's your whole point. Yeah. Just getting a clickbait. I'm, I stop, just stopped. The moment I stopped reading news, it was just like, oh, okay, I feel yeah. a little better. <laughs> yeah, that is better. I started. I also realized that, like, I think a lot of what's going on um, 
is is actually like playing into fears that are already there i think for most people like like yeah. a lot of the disease is super it's like super unpredictable and you don't know who's going to get hurt and you don't know like when people will die like i have old grandparents and this thing coming out made me realize like, oh, I could lose them, you know, within the coming weeks. But right. then I realized like, I'm always kind of scared of losing them, right? Because they're elderly. And and there are young people who are sick from other things that could also always die. But there are yeah, things that I never thought about before. And now I think that like the disease and the fact that actually anybody could always die is like yeah. coming in at me, yeah. you know? Like I'm having an existential crisis over that stuff. I never <laughs> thought about it, you know? So that's the rough part. But I think it's really important to like, I've learned that it's really important to do what you got to do in order to maintain some level of sanity, you know? Yeah. What's the, what's the, um, what's the things you've started doing that, that helped you out on this? I mean, I'm pretty sure a lot of people who are going to listen to this can relate. Um, well, I have started doing like, uh, just some corny stuff. Like I, I started meditating again. I have an app called Headspace and that always helps me a lot. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. I love that one. Cause it's pretty grounded, you know, it's not too spiritual or anything. It's <laughs> just like very practical. And that's, I'm, that's how I, what works for me. Mm. Um, I also do some yoga, some stretching, some exercise, because when I'm stressed, I sit in the same posture for hours and then my neck right. and shoulders are like completely destroyed. <laughs> right. And then I can't draw. So I'm trying to work on that. And I've started just focusing on things outside of the pandemic. So just watching movies and TV shows and spending a lot of time in the garden and um, stuff like this helps a lot. Um, talking with artists, you know, um, like the playgrounds online event that was last week was really great too, because it was just like something totally different to put your attention on for a while. Right. And then, and then you kind of recharge and you can go back to the horrific news when you're, when you've <laughs> recharged a little bit and then you can process some more and then you need to take a break again. So like taking breaks is really like the essence of it all. Right. Yeah. yeah. You have Going to get away from the topic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can't avoid it. Like I know there's some people who just avoid the news and they're like, everything's great. The sun is shining. And I always find that like, <laughs> that's not how I am, you know, cause I right. need to address whatever's stressing me out. Like it doesn't work for me to run away from it, but it breaks are just the most important part. It's also the same with drawing. If I draw too much, you know, you have to take lots of breaks. That's the only yeah. way you can kind of maintain your focus and your physical health. And it's the same with mental health. Yeah. Everyone's so different. Cause like the way, the way I, I talk with friends and ask them the same question, how do you cope with, you know, anxiety? How do you deal with, with uh, problems like that? And the answers are all over the place. Like, oh, I go for a run. I don't care. Yeah. I don't read news. Like, oh my God, the world is falling apart. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. Like I can't not think about that. You know what I mean? And I know mm -hmm. like there are a lot of people who I can really sense who, which people are similar. Like there's this comic artist in the Netherlands that I've followed for a while called Maika Harkis. And she, um, she started making comics only about this topic, but they're like lighthearted comics, you know, and they kind of talk about, right. you know, her process. Um, but I can tell that she's also like, she can't move away from the topic because it feels false, you know, and I, I'm like that too. But then there are other people who like, don't want to hear about the topic anymore. And those right. are the people like friends of mine or like, um, you know, people in my family who are like, just tired of hearing about it. I just know that like, now is not a great time for us to connect because we're complete opposites, you know? So we just need to right. give it some time. <laughs> Yeah, avoiding arguments like yeah, shut up with this coronavirus. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, people become yeah. very extreme, you know, like very polarized in stressful situations. They really notice it. Like I notice it a lot in my That's relationship true. with friends and family. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in general, I I don't know how it is in Europe. I I le I mean, I'm originally from Poland, and I haven't been in Europe for years now. Um, but I remember when I came to United States, that was one of my realization is that this country is a little more polarized left and right, right yeah. and a little more tribal when it comes to spe specifically politics, which I try not pay any attention to, cause that's just way too toxic. Um, but I think, I think all, all the way up to this pandemic it was very amplified almost, you know, everyone was just so on edge and, uh, I feel like this the the situation we're in 
kind of ch it's kind of changing it in a way people are realizing that there are more important things like hey actually you know i have friends that maybe have a different opinion than me but but they're still friends you know at the end yeah. of the day yeah yeah exactly the, there are certain things that don't matter that much um than just you know all of that but but uh, yeah that's interesting I, I meditation i've never done i mean i've done meditation before but it's one of those things that is difficult to kind of keep up with because it's like, yeah i have that too yeah yeah it's like it's like oh it's hokey pokey you know but you do it for a while and and it really helps to sort of like ease your mind and get your head out of that you know noisy space yeah um, for sure yeah I, I was really amazed by the results when i because i usually have like a tough time during the winter so a right. bit of a winter depression every every winter um I just noticed patterns, you know, like every winter there was some mm. kind of thing that happened that made life really tough. And I figured like, okay, uh, I really have to start, you know, taking preventative measures like before, like usually it happens in, um, like January or February. Right. So as soon as the Christmas break is over, I just start like these habits that are intended to get me through the winter. And one of them was meditation. And that was the only way that I consistently did it for like three months or four months. And that's when I really started to notice the difference. Like, um, I'd already read about it. I'd heard that it helped, but only after doing it consistently for a while, it made me realize how the way that it actually works for me is it just makes me aware and it makes right. me observe more. So I just like kind of feel certain things. And then I'm like, Oh, okay. That's interesting. Okay. I'm feeling stressed. And it doesn't feel like I am that emotion. It just feels like I'm looking at it and I have the choice how I want to act. Like gives me just a little bit of room and gotcha. that's, yeah. Yeah that's what I think works really great, but I'm so impatient every day I wake up and I'm like, all right, I'm going to do so much work today. I'm going to make this drawing, that drawing, and I have this to do and have client work. And then I, the, the meditation always feels like it's uh, some stupid chore that I have to do right. yeah, before, yeah. uh, doing what I really want to do. So it's always really hard for me to find the self-discipline, you know, to, to actually right. do it for a while. But now I kind of have to, you know, cause I, I've just back in that winter depression situation, except now it's the spring, but it's like the it's same. It's, spring. <laughs> yeah. It's like the, the coronavirus depression. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully it's, it's going to be over. I mean, it's not going to be like over, over, but, but eventually, yeah. you know, I mean, it seems like most countries and most places are, sort of over the hump and you know easing down so hopefully that's that's going to start helping yeah um to open up um i'm pretty sure a lot of things are going to change in terms of how people behave and and react to one another but yeah, yeah. I, I guess it's out of our controls yeah i think i think the more we know about it the better right because right. like for me the mystery of it was so scary like when i was first hearing about it in february i was like how does this spread you know it, this is yeah. crazy this it just is so unpredictable but now more and more is known about how it spreads and what's safe and what's not safe. like not enough is known but we're getting closer and closer yeah we'll so the, more. yeah like the, the more people know the more i can be like all right this is just a situation instead of just assuming the worst. Cause that's, I'm, I always assume the worst. Right, right, right. Yeah. The fear yeah. of, un sorry, <laughs> <laughs> my chair went down. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That happens too. I'm back. Uh, the fear, the fear, the fear of unknown is something that I think we are all, we're all scared. Uh, most of us, I'm pretty sure there are some wild people like, oh, I love the unknown and I'm doing <laughs> yeah. wild, crazy stuff. But I most never of understand us are like, those people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was watching, um, I don't know, I mean, I, I hope you've seen it, uh, um, Free Solo with Alex Honnold. Yeah, I saw it's, that a while ago, yeah. Would yeah, you, that was What something. happens again in Free Solo? Isn't that like the, is that the Yosemite stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. The dude, the dude that just decides to climb without, yeah. any, without anything. <laughs> yeah, whenever I watch those kind of documentaries, I'm like, I don't get this. You know, like it's awesome that they can do it, but I'm like, you know, your work balance, your work life balance situation is not, is, is out of control. That's what right. I think. Yeah. <laughs> it's, people are so different when it comes to that. Um, it's fascinating. What, but, okay. So I want to kind of roll back. I mean, we've, we've talked about um, COVID and, and, and stress and anxiety, and I want to kind of like slowly roll back to get to know you, get to know you a little more. Um, you said, you know, you explained how you 
how you cope with I mean talked about how you cope with with this this whole situation and stress and anxiety is any of that applies to how you work in terms of you know outside of this whole this whole situation on the normal regular day when you run into problems and or or even just like some people say oh this is a creative block or um i'm having problem focusing or this is just not my day is any of like uh, meditation aspects or routines you have that that kind of allows you to level and get back to your you know your flow your ideal day flow yeah um well for me it's i'm somebody who works like like when i get into my workflow i work really hard and really long like i just stay what how do you put that like once i get into um flow. like yeah like the the groove or the flow that i'm in then i don't really get out um and then so then i tend to work too hard and i tend to like lose touch with like everything so usually i i paint for hours and then when I'm done, I just suddenly realize, like, oh my God, I haven't eaten all day or I haven't, you know, I'm thirsty or I'm shaking. I didn't even realize it. Or like i I'm done drawing and then I realize that I have a headache, you know, but it's only like after I'm done. Because right. I'm not like taking breaks and checking in really on myself. Um and I was like that for a really long time, but then eventually it kind of like um, you know, I ended up have getting an injury in my arm, uh, just having some muscle problems from, from repetitive strain. And that right. was, that was really a wake up call for me. Uh, cause I couldn't draw for like, I actually couldn't do anything with my right arm for like three months. The and, carpal, um, carpal tunnel? no, it wasn't carpal tunnel, but it was like, because the carpal tunnel is like with the nerve. But it was oh, yeah, more yeah. like uh, the muscle. So they called it tennis gotcha. elbow, but it, my whole arm just felt awful, you know? Um, mm. Like sometimes I would wake up at night and the, the muscles were just completely like um, cut, like strained all the time. Uh, it felt really weird. So I had to stop drawing for a while and then I really had to slowly get back into it. And, uh, ever since then I realized like the only way for me to be able to keep doing this for a long time in my life is to really respect those breaks and my, my physical health. Um, that injury also happened after I started like working in the evenings and then the weekends, I had like all these big, um, you know, client jobs at once and I was trying to juggle them all. And, uh, so after that I started working shorter days because I just, I had to learn to accept that my pace of working is just really fast. Like not necessarily that I draw so quickly, but I just work very intensely and I'm right, thinking right, a right. lot while I draw. And I think a normal person who could do like an eight hour work day is, is doing that and maybe a more normal, a more varied or healthy pace. But I work so intensively that eight hours isn't an option for me, you know, so I have right, to work yeah, fewer hours. Sense. I have to take more breaks and I just I have to keep my weekends free and my evenings free. And if I don't do that, then I can you know, I just start to feel it in my muscles again and I start to get a lot of like physical problems. So that, that was like, a you know, it's like what I said with the mental health, that it's important to take breaks from a subject that really like draws you in. And it's the same with drawing. I've really had to learn how to be more present and how to right. like recognize the patterns of thinking for me that mean that I'm becoming obsessive about something. Because that yeah. means that I'll, I'll get like cramps in my hand and all sorts of stuff. Right. Do you ever have, do you ever run in a situation where you're working on something or you have too much work and, and then your brain kind of stops and tells you, you know what, you know, what's the great idea to do now? Learn new things and add more work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I get really over inspired when I'm like super busy. Right. Yeah. When I, especially when I have a lot of client work, a lot of deadlines coming at me, then I'm like, oh my God, I need to change everything. And then I <laughs> like come up with big plans and yeah, definitely. Like that's, that's why for me, I think some artists need a kick in the butt and some artists need to slow down. Like those are t two yeah. different types of artists. I'm the one that always needs to slow down a little bit. I have the same, uh, the, the most busy I am usually like, you know, a couple of client works and 
podcast all of those things all together and and then all of a sudden my brain just stops and like okay you know maybe let's learn new software and yeah you know, completely change your room or something <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it adds up it's uh it's the like um the the, the racing mind i have that yes. i have that in the evenings too like normally normally i try to avoid doing any work in the morning because i'm just usually tired from from working way too late and oh, that's God, like the, that's the real thing where um i don't look at life in terms of mm, it may be the wrong way to say it but you know work-life balance something that everyone talks about but to me it's almost like instead of looking at work time uh, work-life balance i kind of look at it what, what is the priority uh here at the at the very moment whether it's the it's the current day or or, or current week you know so i look at okay i have to do this kind of work that's always going to be priority because i have to pay bills you know or or whatever that is and then you know obviously there's family i, I have daughter mm -hmm. i need to i need to take care of that that's another priority so it kind of i look at the calendar almost like filling filling up empty slots yeah and then whatever whatever is left is like okay that's my that's my time i can either spend it by you know playing games doing nothing resting or doing my my personal work whatever right um i wonder like how how you schedule your your time is it is it more structured or or do you have like run, you run it by priorities do you have like this quote unquote work work life um you know work life balance i mean you talked about the idea that you, you, you avoid working weekends and and evenings for obvious reasons but i wonder like if if any of that is affecting the way you schedule your days as well yeah, I um, well, I recently started being more strict in my planning and scheduling. Um, like last November, I started a new technique. It's like a Dutch book about uh, how to get a grip on your time and on your priorities and goals. Um, like a friend of mine introduced it to me, and I was always complaining to this friend that I felt overwhelmed by emails and by like right. I always started my work day too late and then at the end of the day I would just be rushing like crazy to get to to eat and then quickly you know I would I would be like yeah I'll meet up with you in the evening like 9 p.m you know nice and late it'll be okay and then by 9 p.m I would, wouldn't have eaten dinner yet and I was still rushing to go because I delayed the start of my work day a lot right um so it was like a constant frustration and she was like just read this book and I read it and it was about uh, basically like it's just a structure where you can approach it's like it's it starts with like figuring out how to plan your day. And he talks about like planning your agenda, like your day, like in blocks of minimum half hour blocks mm -hmm. and then being realistic about like what you're really going to do. So like not planning in an hour for like. Uh, figuring out my finances, which is like too vague and you won't get that done in an hour, but more like breaking it down into like, all right, uh, writing, updating my spreadsheet, sending invoices, you know, those are all separate things. So he talks about a whole technique about being, you know, figuring out how you can realistically plan that. And then also reflecting on your progress and your goals every week, right. also reflecting and setting goals for every three months. And then also doing yearly reviews and also doing monthly accountability meetings with somebody or actually weekly accountability meetings, but I made it monthly. Um, and it's like a whole system. Uh, and I started using it um, because I, I was like, maybe this will help me gain a sense of control over my mm -hmm. life. And it really worked. Um, so that's so I'm pretty strict with my scheduling now. I sit down on Monday mornings. I I always start my day with my email because if I don't do my emails every day, it just becomes like a, a tidal wave um, of insanity. And then and then I do like a weekly review. So I look at the last week. What did I do? What didn't I do? What went well and what didn't? And then um, kind of setting the goals for what to do this week and then planning out the blocks of what to do. And um it sounds really complicated, but it's, it really, um, for me, like I started committing to actually spending time doing specific things because right. before I did, you know, I spent much like basically my whole entire life not doing that. And I found out that, uh, you know, whether I got stuff done depended too much on my mood, you know, right. like, yeah. And sometimes I just wouldn't get stuff done and things like social media, right? Social media is like a huge part of, of my life. And it's really like the, the foundation of my career, you know, because I find my client work 
through social media. So it's really important. And I used to just post whenever I had new art and, and I was doing more and more client work and I didn't have any like personal art to post. And I would always feel guilty. You know, I'd always feel bad. Mm. And, and now I just, uh, every Friday I just plan out three posts for the next week and I write it all down and I get it all ready. So I've been doing that for like half a year now. And that, has changed my life a lot. Like it's made it all much more manageable. And especially with this coronavirus stuff, like I feel, I wake up and I just feel overwhelmed, but I can still get the stuff done because I planned it out and I, all I have to do is follow the steps and it just makes it a lot easier. Do you remember which book, uh, helped you out? It's called, it's called grip. Um, it's Dutch. I don't know. Maybe there's a trans, an English translation. Most, most of the books should, should have it, I guess. Um, oh, yeah. So it is in English. Uh, Grip, The Secret of Smart Working. Gotcha. I'll, I'll put it in the uh, description. I think it's really podcast. good because it has the Dutch mentality. Um, like the Dutch are known for being a, like pretty I, I, down to earth. I don't know if that's the right term, but like just uh, not too wishy-washy. You know, yeah, very just leveled. leveled, exactly. Yeah, and and yeah. Du- Dutch people don't like, like, I don't think you'd do great selling a book here where you say like a way to achieve great success and make <laughs> lots of money. Like those books do really well in the U S right. But they don't do so great yeah, here because amazing, people are yeah. like, yeah, people in the Netherlands are like, no, just give me something that I could actually use, you know? And, and that book had that. It was very practical. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of self-help books are like that, where it's like you follow this 10, 10 step formula yeah. and you're going to achieve success. You know, it's like, ah, uh, it's yeah. really just you're describing your life and that's what it is. Yeah, what it it's is. like how to gain great success. <laughs> Write a book about gaining great success. Yeah. And I yeah, read yeah. it and I'm like, you already did that. <laughs> I really or, can't yeah. stand that sort of stuff. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's one of the reasons I stopped re- uh, reading most of the um, uh, inspirational, quote unquote, self help books because all of all they do is just like if you follow this formula, and also they are very personal, meaning they only work for people who are exactly like the author, you know, yeah. like the, the the person who wrote it. If you're exactly, yeah. if you have exactly the same mentality characteristics, you're kind of like similar person in terms of how you think about life. Definitely something to follow. But yeah. the moment you steer away from that, you, 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 you maybe are not so well inclined towards, I don't know, deadlines or whatever, then that's just not, all of a sudden it's not working for you. Because like, I, yeah. you know, I mean, we all know it, building habits is the most difficult thing to do. Right. And yeah, and sometimes, and sometimes if it just doesn't align with you specifically, yeah. it's, it's, it's incredibly difficult. Yeah, that's the thing that I think is like really important if you really want, because I love self-help books. Like that's my passion next to drawing. Um, <laughs> I read self-help books like all the time. Like most <laughs> of the books I've read in the last couple of years were all self-help books, but they were... Um, not like this formula for success type of books, but they were really focused on um, getting you to think about your own goals and priorities. And that really inspired me. Um, So when I, uh, I give a workshop on social media and a workshop on drawing, and I always start by getting the students to think and reflect about like, what is it that I want to achieve? You know, like what are my values? What are, what is my tone of voice? what is my style and that they kind of grow from there. Because if I tell other people what to do, it's based on what works for me, but people need to do what works for them. You know what I mean? And that's why I really like the grip technique because it was based, um, you know, it starts really with thinking about like, all right, you know, why do I want to do this? And there's a whole chapter about like figuring out your own goals I know it sounds really obvious, right? Like anybody could figure out their own goals, but it's a lot about like, what, what are your values too? What are your core values right. and what really drives you and motivates you? And like, there's a lot of stuff that anybody would want to achieve, but what is really like what you want to achieve? And I always love that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's sometimes difficult to figure out what you want to achieve in the first place. Cause yeah. it's very easy to follow someone else's formula. Cause it's, yeah, it's, you, you already have it on the table. It's almost like, you know, when you want to learn art and, the, the obvious thing is follow tutorials, but uh, the biggest pitfall of that is you, you look at the tutorial and then you repeat the tutorial, and but then you don't apply any of that towards, you know, 
that knowledge you just gained towards learning something new or, or figuring out if, if you can use that technique in a completely different way. Yeah. Um, which is, I think, the biggest problem, like just, just finding, oh, I need a solution. I need it now. I need it on the, on the plate right in front of me instead of like, hmm, maybe this is like a, a piece of a puzzle that I need to sort of like, you know, jigsaw together myself. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely applies. No, yeah, self-help books, you know, I, I, I avoid, I try to avoid the ones that are like typically, this is the 10 steps to success. That yeah. just doesn't, yeah, doesn't sound good from the get-go. Um, but even, even more focused ones, like one I've read that I really liked, uh, was Eat That Frog by Robert mm -hmm. Greene. Mm -hmm. Um, and it might be again, because it's jiving with the way I work, but it's, but it's also some of the principles that those book, one of uh, specifically that one was talking about, um, is repeating in other books as well. So like, it's almost a common denominator across across all of them and that's that's what i find useful reading those books like okay maybe maybe those people have different approaches to things and different psych, uh, psychology when it comes to figuring out figuring out your life but there are certain common things that kind of repeat across yeah and that's like the okay this is like a good good thing to to pick up and and try to yeah. apply and, and one of those was and Robert's Green book was uh, sort, of, sort of like putting the the most difficult thing you're going to do either that day or that week right in front of you and challenging it uh, from the get go and like really forcing yourself to do it so that once you're done, everything else that seems to be difficult or time consuming now becomes easy because you basically uh, challenge the, the, the most difficult thing. It's almost like and the and the uh analogy is like it's almost imagining you have that frog in front yeah. of you and you're supposed to eat it yeah, and then, yeah. i mean nothing else is going to be worse than that you know mm -hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> later yeah. in the week yeah i've heard people say that before yeah like, i'm just gonna eat the frog and i'm like what <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i've yeah. heard about this too i think that's, that sounds really good because i think it's really important to like that's what i got from grip is to like right and from meditation, it's like, be aware. Cause with me, when I really don't want to do something, I push it away. Like I, mm -hmm. I push it into some other part of my mind and it's not like, I'm not really processing it. You know, I delay it, I procrastinate. So, um, and being like aware, like having, being able to think like, wow, there's this thing that I have to do and I really don't want to do it, but it would help me so much to do it. And you put right. it in your goal. So you really face it head on. Like that's something that I learned from grip because I plan it in now. And then I look at my agenda and the moment comes where I have to do this thing. And I'm like, Oh, really? <laughs> but then I do it, you know, cause like I made yeah. a commitment, you know? Yeah. yeah. I didn't do that before. I didn't really make commitments. I just kind of went with the flow, but it was a little too much of just going with the flow. It wasn't enough, uh, planning or structure. Yeah. I want to shift gears a little bit. There's, there's a topic we, we kind of touched upon before we started this um which is uh encouragement to do art and sort of like the environment we we i mean it seems like me and you uh have grown in similar environments in terms of knowledge of what art is and uh where it can lead you lead you i wonder where it all started for you like what, what was the moment where you realized that not all i mean obviously most of the artists that i that i talk with all of them is gonna most of them not all of them but most of them say like you know i always been an artist and i always like drawing um i guess that comes with with just territory the characteristics of how we are uh made um but oftentimes you know i find out that most most of the people i talk with they they they, they have this moment in their life that they realize well, not most of them, some of them, most of them have a moment that kind of pushes them from I'm a hobbyist to like, I want to do it for a living. Right. And then a subset of that, of that, uh, population, uh, population, a weird word <laughs> to say about friends. <laughs> uh, it is a population those, technically. It is true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a subset of those who, uh, have like a defining moment, uh, in which they realize, you know what, this is, this is not only something I can do but actually make a living. 
uh, which I didn't know about. It, it, how was it for you? Did you did you always knew that you want to be an artist and want to make a living doing that? Uh, did you have like support from your from your parents? Like, what was what was it like for you? Um, well, I grew up with the you know believing that you couldn't make a living as an artist. Uh, you know, right. I think everybody kind of believed that, still believes that. Um, and New York, and, especially. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I grew up like we moved around a lot um, and we went to international school and international school is like super ambitious. Mm -hmm. um, like international schools are it's not that we came from like a super like we definitely came from a privileged family. But my dad like wasn't a diplomat or anything. He, he just worked as an archivist, which I think is a really mm -hmm. cool job. But it wasn't like um, but I went to the same school as like you know, ambassadors, daughters and stuff. Right, and, right, and those right. schools were really focused on like pushing you to your maximum potential. And it was like always, um, you know, thinking about your future. And especially when we got to high school, it was like, all right, um, you know, wh which colleges are, are you going to, do you want to go to? And like my friends were signing up for like Oxford, Harvard, you know, um, like big art schools, big law schools, all over the world. And I was, um, so I was thinking like, I can't do art because I have to have a real job because also the people around, I was super uh, motivated student. So I was like really striving for the highest possible grades. Mm -hmm. So I was one of those kids that was like on the, in the honor society and stuff and like, uh, super hardworking. So I did the international baccalaureate program and I was like really into history and biology. I really liked the social sciences. I loved, uh, you know, philosoph philosophical concepts. Uh, so we had to do like an essay called theory of knowledge and we had to like address some kind of like some, some kind of like philosophical concept. And I was really into that. So I really didn't think that art was, is in my future. I really thought right. it was just for fun. And then I, um, but like you did became, it for fun anyways, right? I was obsessed with drawing. Like, I loved right. it. It was so fun. <laughs> um, so I would study, 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 study. And then I would be like, all right, now I can draw for the rest of the night. And I would stay up all night just drawing. Um, so I was, like, really into it. But I didn't think that it was, like, a real direction. So mm. I was like, all right, I'm going to do anthropology. So I looked at a college for anthropology. Uh, also history. Like, all these different um, social sciences type directions. And then right before because I was applying to Dutch colleges and Dutch colleges like you can you can apply pretty last minute so I had more time than my friends did who were already working towards certain colleges from like age 16 and 17 um and then suddenly something snapped you know I was like I can't not do art this is going to be hell for me you know because right. I, I love drawing I was always so excited to to get back behind my computer it was something that truly like, I remember when I did my um, exams, my high school exams, and then school was over, right? And I was like, I can draw all day. And all I did, like, everybody was out partying, and I was, like, drawing just nonstop for weeks. Um, so I was like, all right, I have to do something else. Uh, I have to do something art-related, but it has to sound like a real job. So... Um, <laughs> And not artists, you know, and, uh, right. and my art teacher was like, have you ever heard of animation? And I was like, that sounds good. And then I instantly signed up to <laughs> animation school and that's how it went. You know, that's, that's awesome. That's how quickly it went. Um, but I thought you... yeah. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I thought animation sounded like, um, like I could cover my bases with it. So I would be able to draw characters, backgrounds, tell stories, make storyboards, like all the things. So it sounded like if I couldn't get a job as an animator, maybe I could get a job as a character designer or as an illustrator. Right. Or, you know, I felt like it was the, the way to build the most broad skill set. Did you follow? I mean, when when was that that shift from? I mean, I don't know. I think we're a similar age. Uh, How old uh, are you? 35, I think. 36 actually i know that if you don't know your age we're probably a similar age because i also don't know yeah. my age a lot of the time yeah, there you go um <laughs> i'm also in my I mid I, I, sh I shouldn't yeah i shouldn't ask about age <laughs> oh no it's okay it's wrong um <laughs> no but i remember when I, I when it all snapped uh for me I, I mean i was in a similar space where like literally well my mom literally told me like you're not gonna be an artist i don't want to i don't yeah. want you to waste your life you know <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> Wow, big words. Now, now big words, yeah. 
Uh, all to her credit, like she, the moment she realized that, you know, I can make a living doing that, she was like, oh, awesome. Yeah, go for it. Um, but I think that's, that's sort of like the stigma of art in, in general, or at least used to be back then. I don't know. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's changing now because we're more connected mm -hmm. and, uh, it's easier to look things up. And I think parents, uh, these days are, are more in tune with, with the internet, social media, and they kind of realize, okay. That's a that's a legit career path. I mean, for God's sake, there's people who are making money doing just TikToks, right? Yeah. <laughs> and making times have changed. That. Yeah, <laughs> or playing video games on on Twitch yeah. and 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 making a lot of money doing that. So times are changing, but I rem yeah, I remember back then it was like the information was scarce, internet was just starting. Right. Um, so like you would go on forums and oh, there is a concept art forum or illustration yeah. forum. <laughs> And there are people drawing, you know? Yeah, um, I remember that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was all a lot vaguer. My parents also really thought, like, you know, they were, like, they uh, also had the idea that it wouldn't be the smartest choice for me. Right. Um, but when I told them that I really wanted it, they were like, all right, fine, you got to do what you want to do. Like, my parents aren't too... Um, strict. No. Not too strict, they, yeah they weren't over involved at all. Like they helped me mm -hmm. and they wanted to guide me, but they never uh, had a very strong opinion about what I should or shouldn't do. And gotcha. even with my art, like they're, they're proud of me, but they're not like super, super over involved. Like they, <laughs> when I show them my art, they're like, Oh, Okay. They aren't befriending you on Facebook and like com commenting on every post you do. <laughs> no, I think they follow me. No, my mom has a colleague who follows me and my mom gets a lot of art updates about me because From a one of her colleagues <laughs> is like, Hey, your daughter, she's, she posted this on Instagram. <laughs> it's really funny. Like me and my mom don't really talk about that. But I think that that really was, um, I think that was a positive thing looking back, you know, because right. if you get encouraged like a lot, then I think that you become, it, it really depends. There are a lot of factors, but there's a risk, you know, that you, like one of my close friends, she's an amazing artist. She's super talented. And her parents were always like, you are so talented. You are so right, good. Yeah. And she, I think that she has it in the back of her head that she might disappoint her parents if she doesn't, you know, keep it up. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, but if you get like no encouragement, then you also doubt yourself. Right. So my parents are right in that sweet zone of like, not like caring, but not too much. Yeah. It, it, it's so dependent on, on who you are. Right. Cause, cause some people just love to get kicked first and like, I'll show you, I will show you better. And yeah. there are others who are like, you discourage them and they just never, never go and never do that anymore. You know, they yeah. get so discouraged by not having any positive uh, input that, yeah, it's, it, I'm done. I'm over. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's always the, a delicate balance with creativity, you know, between like being encouraged yeah. and being pushed. And the participation trophy, you know, like someone who's just like always constantly telling you, you are the best. And, and then you go in the world is like, Oh, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Then it's like a rude awakening when you, uh, yeah. step yeah. into the industry. Yeah. So, you know, you went, I guess you went to, to study animation then, um, yes. did you finish, uh, finish the study or like, how did it go for you? I went one year to study animation in Belgium because at the time, so my family moved around every four years and at the time my parents lived in Brussels in Belgium. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, I'll go to a Belgian art school. Um, there's a school in Gent called Kosk and it's like one of the, or, K-A-S-K. Um, mm. And they're one of the best animation schools, I think, in Europe. Um, so gotcha. I was like, all right, I'm going to go for that. But that was like the totally wrong choice for me. Um, I had a really hard time connecting with like the artistic sensibility of the teachers and also like culturally uh, with Belgium, with Belgians, like at the time I spoke mostly English and my Dutch wasn't so great. And the Dutch that I did speak was very like Netherlands Dutch, which is really mm -hmm. different from Belgian Dutch. There's a lot of miscommunication, a lot of like, I guess, culture shock. Um, and I didn't end up, uh, finishing that. I kind of like vanished <laughs> in the last month of school. I was like, I got sick for a week. And then I was like, what if I never go back? <laughs> and then I just didn't go back. Um, switched to a Dutch animation school um, in 
in Utrecht, where I still live. And mm -hmm. that worked out a lot better for me. So I really found my way at that school. The Dutch school had more of a mentality like, you know, we'll support you in doing what you want to do creatively, sort of like my parents, I guess. I right. guess it's a Dutch culture thing. Um, <laughs> in Belgium, they were much more like, you have to do what we want you to do. And that, right. um, you know, is not is a good challenge to rise to, but I was like really drowning, you know, like there was too many, too many challenges for me. Um, and I really felt completely disconnected from my creative flow completely. Like, uh, on the first day, my Belgian teachers told me like, we don't want to see you draw this kind of colorful girly stuff anymore. And I was like, okay, I could try, but that's like everything that I love, you know? Right. Um, and then in the Netherlands, they were more like, they still didn't like it, but they didn't like, you know, tell me that I wasn't allowed to draw it. Like I needed to figure they, they tried to challenge me to like go deeper with right. what I, with what I wanted to make, which worked a lot better. Yeah, it's and, probably a better uh, approach. <laughs> yeah, it, it much better. And I, I think that the school in Belgium is still like it's a really good school. But I think that like the creative goals of that school was just very different. Like they wanted to to create like independent animators that win like Oscars for their animated shorts. But then back in right. 2005, before the all of the animated shorts that win Oscars were like Pixar shorts, it was like back when the animated shorts that won Oscars were like super artistic and, right, and symbolic right. and just really um, traditional. And uh, the, they were really trying to create artists and in the Netherlands, at uh, the Utrecht School of the Arts, they were just trying to train animators, which was a lot better for me. Yeah, I think that's a better approach. Um, in the hindsight, looking at what you're saying, um, I mean, that's that's one of the reasons I didn't go to art school, because art schools in Poland specifically were very much like the Belgian school. but Yeah, very traditional, mm -hmm. right? Minus the push towards winning Oscars. <laughs> it was more like, I'm wearing uh, fancy sweaters and, you know, I'm an artist. <laughs> and then artist. deal with those. Yeah, artist. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and so, and you would have those teachers who had no talent whatsoever. They just, they just felt like, it, it felt more like a modern art kind of deal where like the, the weirder you are, the, that, that means you're the better you are, you know? Yeah. less less involved with skill whatsoever but it's interesting what you said about you know your your experience with the Bel belgium school when they said like you're not allowed to do that and it's kind of funny how how it all turns turns around now with social media where well not only you're allowed to do that but but that's your living you know where it's yeah. like i i had the same um experience with concept art for the longest time where um when when i started drawing digitally it was frowned upon to use photography in your in your paintings like it was just oh, like yeah. if you're using photos you're That's the worst cheating. yeah you're cheating you're the yeah. worst you should, you should <laughs> quit you know and then i don't know i don't know if you know uh, i mean uh craig mullins the grandfather of of basically of <laughs> of yeah. all digital art I remember when it came out, like someone broke down his work and then I think he, he, he even came out and said like, yeah, obviously I use photos. Like that's, that's just a normal thing. Right. Yeah. Um, and then everyone kind of stopped shaming <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> and, and things changed, but, but there's always a, uh, there's always seems to be like this conviction that comes from people that that's the way to do it. That's, that's how you're supposed to be instead of like the focus on encouragement, like, Hey, you have your own style it's it's okay to have it maybe challenge it every now and then so you have yeah. like different perspective or or grow your uh, expand your perspective on things um but generally speaking like hey why why don't you do that you know why don't you follow your passion because like that's the that's one of the things that kind of drives us to do that stuff right like imagine yeah. if, if you're an artist and someone said like from now on you're only gonna draw um i don't know super realistic environment pictures that could be used for like i don't know like post-apocalyptic game where everything is dead brown and kind of ugly yeah. you know <laughs> like it works works yeah. for films you know but would you like yeah. doing that probably not yeah i feel like making somebody go 100 percent outside of their comfort zone for reasons outside of that person so you yeah. know if you decide to go outside of your comfort zone 
go for it. You know, you just made that choice for a reason. But like if you're pressured from the outside to do that, then you're kind of cutting off, you know, like symbolically cutting off the artist's legs. You know what I mean? Like because they don't you that's the starting point, you know, for our, for your creativity is like what you love and what inspired you to start drawing. And for me, like I just didn't know I was completely blocked. I just completely didn't know what to do. I didn't know if what I was making was any good. I, I was totally lost um, because I had been disconnected with what started m me drawing to begin with. And I think that, uh, you know, I, I get the criticism, right? Because everybody's got like a thing that they learn to draw and then that becomes like their thing and they'll fall back on that a lot. And sometimes right. they need to be challenged. They need to be pushed outside of it. That's definitely like, and in my case, you know, I like, I told you that I like when I get, when I start working, I stay in that zone for a really long time. But also like when I find something that I like to draw, I keep drawing that thing for a really long time. So I like to right. stay in my comfort zone sometimes way too much. Um, and pushing, you know, being pushed to get out of it is, is important, but it's like, I think it's important for, for, uh, for teachers to, you know, kind of try to uh, encourage the students to elevate what they make mm -hmm. rather than completely eliminate it. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. It's, it's just a lot of gatekeeping. It's a lot of like, this is art and this isn't. And, and that's ridiculous because the times are changing way too fast to be able to say like, this is what you should and shouldn't do. Like, that's the thing that those teachers really didn't understand. Like they didn't know that, like there's a whole community of people who, who love, you know, uh, super colorful art who love anime, manga, even furries, you know, you have them at comic cons. Now you have people yeah. making a living off of that stuff. You have people with patrons, you have people with comics. None of those teachers saw that coming, you know? Um, and what I noticed as well is that like, um, there were a lot of students who did like believe in what the teachers were saying, right? They were like, okay, I, uh, we really need to make something super artistic. It's super creatively superior and like for a niche group of, of art critics mm -hmm. and they did an amazing job and that stuff was really beautiful. But then now that everybody's in their thirties, they're all like, I'm tired of just scraping by. I, w I just want to make a living. Like a lot of artists really struggle with making a living, you know? Yeah. And, and, um, the animators who tried to, you know, like stick to these very rigid ideas of what is good and bad in animation, they found themselves struggling a lot in this t day and age, just, um, you know, being able to build their career so that they could support their families or buy a house, right. like the priorities change. Right. So when you're a student, it's really easy to be like, I'm going to sacrifice the likability and accessibility of my art so that it's, you know, better art. But then by the time you're older, you're like, I just want to make some money, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> so I, there's a lot pragmatic. of animators. Yeah. There's a lot of animators from my, uh, from my school in Utrecht who are now all focusing on YouTube because they're like, this is how we can uh, generate some income. You know, it's a lot better than trying to work for these small scale clients in the Netherlands. Cause like the animation industry here is so small. So I feel like that's what the teachers really missed in school. Like I get yeah. that they were trying to make us, they were trying to make us the best artists we could be, but they weren't really giving us the tools to just be able to make a stable living off of what we did and be more commercially, commercially motivated, you know? Yeah. That's important too. How did you figure out yourself? I mean, going to going to university and studying is, you know, obviously they help you to find a way. Uh, but but as you said, usually it, it also means that you're sort of like applying their thinking and what they feel is best for you instead of like figuring out what's best for you by yourself. Like what was the what was the what was the moment or how do you how do you how do you find your way between <coughs> you know all of the ideas that are out there to figure out this is this is exactly what i want to do because it's, i think that that's one of the most scary thing for aspiring artists to sort of like look at the world especially now with with how connected we are it's the easiest time to learn obviously because al almost all of the material you want to learn about is free on youtube you can find everything there uh but it also means that everything is available and and the, and you have a, a vast abundance of choices and it's very difficult to know like you look at you know i can look at your work and 
and I appreciate the way you, you paint, the, the way you draw. But like, if I was a student, like, where do I start? Uh, that's, that's, that's so difficult because like, do I need to learn anatomy? Do I need to learn that? How do I use colors? Just so many layers. Or should I, should I draw these characters or maybe should I do anime or maybe environments or maybe animation or maybe become a 3D modeler? Like the, the abundance of choices now is, is, is overwhelming, but, but it used yeah. to be even in the times when, when we were starting to become artists, uh, and, and thinking about it to, to make a living doing that. You know, you, you maybe wouldn't have so many choices in terms of knowing what what's out there or or how many things you could do technically that were that were you know making you money, but 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 also meant like you didn't have enough information about specific topics either because mm -hmm. it was very difficult to find anything. And artists usually wouldn't talk about how much they make or if they make anything at all. Right, Maybe something like hearsay. You know. Yeah. Um. So I wonder, like, what what was it for you? How did you how did you figure out yourself to actually get employed and 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 start to make a living? Um, I just kind of deep dived into it. Like, I just I took a leap of faith. So I graduated, and I was like, all right, I have no idea what I should do. I'll just um, I'll just go with the flow. Like, take on any right. opportunities that come along. Um, I had, I was very lucky because I already had my deviant art account since 2003 and I graduated in 2009. And by that time it, I had built up like a name for myself on deviant art. And now deviant art yeah. is like, you know, a corner, like a dusty corner of the internet, unfortunately. But in that time it was a really big, big website. And also clients were there. It was becoming more and more commercial. So, um, people were looking for artists, you know, for small projects on DeviantArt and they would find my art there. So I got a lot of like requests for all sorts of random jobs. Of course, people knew me from like, I had connections from the animation school. So in the right. beginning I did a lot of like little things like little car car cartoony character design jobs or like animation work, uh, with former students, um, and then I kind of like, I did commissions as well to bridge the gaps. So, and I was very lucky that I had a, like a low um, cost of living at that time. Like me and my boyfriend were living in a temporary housing. Um, we would move every couple of months and that was like super cheap. We didn't have a car. And so we could kind of wing it. Um, and I just did whatever came along and slowly I got more and more kind of character design or concept art ish kind of work. Right. So people saw that I could paint and they, they saw that I was drawing the female characters. Um, back in 2000, 2009, 2010, you had a lot of online games like web, like flash games. <laughs> Remember flash games? Flash games yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Before apps. Right. Yep. And Before I, uh, apps. <laughs> yeah. And I would do like art for those. And that was pretty fun. Cause those were all like smaller projects with a smaller budget, but I would just like, you know, I'd start small and I kind of like, you know, brought, raised my fee every couple of months and then certain clients would drop off and then new clients would come along. So I managed to kind of like evolve the work that I did. And then about four years after I graduated, I suddenly found myself being approached by big names. Um, right. so Lego Gorilla games and, um, I was approached for a Coca-Cola commercial spot and they were all character design jobs. And, and I was suddenly like, whoa, what's going on? You know, these are like big clients. And that's when I sort of took the turn in my career that I'm at now, where I'm doing mostly character design for like games and for like basically big IPs where there's like a large budget to develop the concepts. So there's right. a lot of creative freedom. There's a lot of time. Um, and the IPs are very specific, you know, they're very like defined IPs where I can kind of see how I can adapt my style to, to what they're looking for. Um, so really, and it was just, 
I was, you know, I just slowly build up my resume. And I remember when I was first approached by Lego, they were like, so what kind of projects have you worked on before? And I was like, yeah, I've done a lot of art for Flash games. And some of those games were for kids. So I've done stuff for kids. And they were like, okay, that sounds good. That sounds good. And so you really have to kind of build up your, yeah. your portfolio that way. You know what I mean? Like every little project you do, you can reference that later and be like, yeah, I have experience in this. And it's true. You do gain experience in all those things. So I, I slowly became a character designer, like just through, through that path. And I learned so much from my clients, like the feedback that they gave me, you know, the way that they would direct the creative process and the kind of stuff they wanted to see. And I was very lucky. I'm still very lucky to have clients that they do a lot of focus testing. So, you know, they make, I make the sketches, they at, at certain points show the concept and the work to the to the group, the target audience that they're working on. And then I get, yeah. And then they tell me like sort of what's coming out of that. And I learned so much about, you know, how they, how they think and develop these concepts and how the, how, how sketches and character design spark the imagination. Right. So it's always been very collaborative. So, uh, that's, that's how I got to where I am now. And I think interesting, actually, I've never heard, I mean, I've worked with clients. I've never heard them doing that. That's, That's very, that's very intriguing. I've had so how, how would it work? Clients. So so basically, they would take the I guess the round of of designs that they would produce with with you and and maybe other artists, and then bring it to like a like a randomized group that they have. Or... Yeah, well, some of them have done that. Some of them are just like, oh yeah, we had a test like last month, and the feedback right. is that we don't like the you know the characters feeling too young at this moment, and so they keep it vague. But I was actually allowed to be at a focus test of, of one of my oh, clients, interesting. Interesting. where they kind of like discuss the concept with a group, and uh, the focus test was being carried out by a third party as well, by like data analysts and collectors and. <laughs> I really, I got so many insights into how, how these, uh, you know, how art plays in to like these bigger productions. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I feel, I feel kind of like weird about it because, you know, online you have my art, you can see the art that I make for myself and the stuff that I make for fun and some client work, but not a lot of it, but there's a whole other side of me. That's like learned so much about character design and sketching and drawing for these clients, adapting my work to these projects and the target audiences that we worked with. But I can't really share that side because it's all, all under NDA, it's all top secret. Yeah, that's the problem, right? <laughs> yeah, and it's 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 really valuable uh, knowledge, you know. So I hope one day I can talk about that stuff in more detail, maybe show some yeah. of the sketches um, that I've made. But um, unfortunately, a lot of what I've made is all hidden from the world. Yeah, that's the part that sucks working for clients. Is it's yeah. sometimes uh, the worst. The worst that can happen is you work for a client. And you're like, you're really happy with work. And then the project shuts down. And yeah. then usually that means, well, I'm never going to show any of that. <laughs> yeah. Because they, yeah, they always, a lot, but they like, yeah. the project never gets released. And then they're like, well, we're going to keep it just in case we need it in exactly. the future. And I'm like, exactly. ah, I'm not going to show it to anybody. <laughs> yeah. There's but a project. I, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, what I wanted to say was like, I think it's really important for people who are looking for a career path now to think like to try and stay as flexible as they possibly can, given the situation. And of course, you have to be very tactical, right? And you have to think yeah. like, oh, you know, I want to work in this field, so I should adapt my portfolio to that. And definitely that's important. But um, if you have some kind of thing that you love to do, that's your area of expertise, that's like your area of passion, um, there you never know what twist will take place, what kind of house situations will fall into place so that you can maybe one day do what you love to do the most, you know? So I always tell people like, keep your passion projects on the side and keep doing what you really love to do for yourself and keep sharing that with the world because who knows what will grow out of that. Cause that's how my whole career grew. Right. Yeah. Just out of my secret guilty pleasure, uh, kind of digital art stuff that I was making outside of school. It's very interesting what you said about focus groups. I, I, I'm still kind of processing yeah, it. Yeah, it is really interesting. It's like a psychology aspect. Yeah, it, 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 it makes a lot of sense. I mean, a lot of, I mean, normally, I, I guess films do that, uh, but on more like a high, higher level, not specifically, oh, let's, let's look at concepts, but it's more of a higher level, like what is, what is what's, what's kind of like underlying story 
or character traits that we want to uh, pursue that will specifically like maybe hit the market in the right way or in the, or the wrong way. Um, I guess the brands like Lego, it makes it, you know, it would make much more sense because you have like a very specific target audience. So it like, you cannot just design random things and, and expect that's going to jive with the five-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People think that like, it counts for all productions. Also in games happens a lot too. You People yeah. like a game or a movie or a toy or whatever comes out and people think like, oh, they made that. And now it's just in the stores, but like the process, like the, the, the budgets that go into it are enormous and like whoever's creating those projects needs to justify that, you know, yeah. to the company. They need to be able to say like, yeah, but we have proof that this is going to be successful. And it's like on one hand, really interesting because that's where the concept development comes in. That, that's where you test things out. And I really think that art in general is a trial and error process. Even if you make it for yourself, you're just testing stuff out, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, it's like a curse because it limits how visionary your concept can be. Because True. sometimes yeah. certain things seem unsuccessful at first, but then they like gain a cult following later or something. I once saw a really good talk about Team Fortress 2 which was like, you know, the first semi-realistic stylized game, I think, uh, yeah. big game. And they did a focus test with their style, like uh, with the, you know, because they had looked at like Lion Decker's work and they looked at like the Incredibles and all these stylized genres mm. of art. And they showed that to the target audience and the focus test failed horribly because they hated it. Like the gamers were like, what is this? You know, this is not a game. Um, you know how gamers can be very like, protective over the brand and then they just decided to throw out the results and stick with the direction anyway which was really cool uh, of them because it, it yielded one of the coolest looking games at that time yeah. but yeah. not a lot of people have the courage you know a lot of not a lot of big companies especially now when everything's kind of a remake or a throwback or like falling back on like Sequel. really well no yeah <laughs> sequels not a lot of studios have the courage to make something like radically new and innovative and and that's also because they're focus testing a lot and just like trying to appease an yeah. audience that isn't always flexible and isn't always open to something new i think it was um was it steve jobs saying that he he knows better what what people want and doesn't <laughs> and something just... like something along the lines <laughs> Um, yeah, sometimes you have to kind of like, you know, subvert expectations to create yeah. something truly beautiful. And that doesn't happen as much anymore. Like the entertainment industry has become quite entrenched at the moment. Yeah. I mean, to your point, um, look at Blade Runner, the original one, you know, when, when it came out, it was an absolute disaster. No, no one w went to see the film and then it became one of the most beloved sci-fi movies of all time. Yeah. And gained like a cult following and and made I think it made a lot of money from from DVD sales. Yeah. Uh, overall, but it was completely unsuccessful. Um and it's kind of interesting. I got I got to work with with Ridley Scott once. He's a fascinating mm -hmm. person. How awesome. And I was like I I went to I went to a meeting with him and I was like you know scratching my head what, what the hell am i doing here <laughs> like how is that even possible you know yeah. i have a bunch of friends that work with them and he's like he's, he's such a sweet guy it's like yeah. the most sweet person you'll ever the meet. most talented people yeah. don't seem to be aware that they are the most talented people so they yeah. don't act superior <laughs> but it was yeah it was interesting and, and you know it's, it's just but but he has a trait oh. and i think a lot of a lot of people on his level have that trait where they're uncompromising there is just this is my vision i'm going for it and i don't okay. care what you think that's 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 what's going to happen whether whether people are going to like it or not it's 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 a my it's my thing but i you know focus groups I, in video games I, I remember when we worked on the last of us we would do like alpha and beta testing and and you would have people testing the gameplay and and you know just to, just to figure out but it was more on the gameplay level i i think where yeah. we would figure out, okay, is it, is it even fun to play, you know? Because it's, it's one thing to make it look nice, but mm -hmm. another to make it actually fun. I think what you said about movies, that makes sense too. That actually explains, um, you know, why a lot of movies are pretty much the same. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they kind of all look the same. 
They don't like go yeah. go against the mold. Yeah, I feel like that's all. a thing now. Uh, like, well, especially in the big productions, you know, yeah. it's all comics nowadays. I mean, you know about that because you work with Marvel. <laughs> um, of course, I love a lot of the movies that are coming out. Like, don't get me wrong, they're super entertaining. Um, but there's there's not as much creativity taking place. Yeah. Um, as in pre, I remember when I graduated from animation school or like when I started in 2005, the Pixar movies were always awesome. Like every time a Pixar movie came out, it was like, we're going to watch the whole class would go together and we would be like, that was the best movie ever. And it always was one of the best movies ever. You know, they were so innovative and now they're just doing a lot of sequels and the spark is gone, you know, like the the innovate innovation like the bigger those studios get the more they'll fall into a comfort zone and then eventually they'll crumble and then some new studios will come in and make something really creative and unexpected and those are always the the most fun phases i think of like the big movie yeah. productions yeah i think uh i think not having steve jobs in, in pixar <laughs> kind of changed everything yeah yeah was that the reason i remember i read an article about i don't really remember what it was what it boiled down to but there were a lot of like insecurities wasn't he, wasn't he there all the way through the end i think he was yeah i think so yeah oh. but, but it's too what, bad yeah, they it, used yeah. to be a lot more in yeah a lot more creative a lot more uh but don't you think yeah don't you think that now whatever is happening I, and i want to kind of move that to that subject uh social media when you look at what's going on on instagram and and you know behance and twitter and youtube like those are the spaces that kind of become those those you know sort of like playgrounds for artists to experiment try new stuff see what what sticks uh don't you think that that's like the new sort of up and up and coming medium mm-hmm. That yeah. might steer yeah. things a little bit. Yeah, well, what I've noticed is that uh, streaming media is becoming so exciting. So, like, Netflix is making these amazing productions, right? right? And, you know, Klaus, uh, that animation was was great. Like, you wouldn't see that being picked up by the huge studios, but Netflix right. is, is making getting it done, right? So there you can see so much creative stuff happening. Like, I always love those Netflix originals. And social media definitely is a place where it is like one big focus group actually, because it's like, you're constantly testing out. Everybody's constantly testing out like what works, what doesn't work. Everybody's kind of winging it, you know, like Instagram is now like a huge, super commercial platform where all these influencers are active and big companies. But before that, you know, it was created as just a photography sharing platform and it kind of evolved into what it is now because people found creative ways to use it to their advantage and to like make a brand for themselves. Right. So it, it is really one big playground of people trying out like different types of content and seeing what excites people and what like creates engagement and genuine connection. That That's what I love about social media. Do you think, do you think the idea of um, focus groups or just generally like looking at what sticks uh, influences artists like yourself in, in the way you work and in, in the way you produce your personal work? Because um, like working for clients is a little different, right? Because then mm-hmm. then you're getting paid for 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 your labor basically, right. and and you're on behest of what they really want from you, uh, and you want to respect that. You're getting paid for doing that, but but doing personal work is kind of different, right? Because you're in a way. Well, that that would be another question. Like, what if you treat um, hypothetically personal work as a business as well? Because I, I, I know some people that do that and they do it pretty, pretty successfully. Uh, I wonder, like, what, what is your take on this? Like, the, are you we- we- weirded out that there's some aspects of the social media that kind of encourage you to think about your personal work and that sort of like this creative flow that you're you're putting putting out there because you, you love and enjoy doing that. But it kind of asks you to commercialize it because like hey more likes you know more people gonna see that stuff all that all that kind of all that kind of uh thinking is there a way yeah. like, is it affecting you 
Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. I think it does. I mean, it would be a lie to say that it doesn't. Um, right. I could, I could say like, no, I'm totally unaffected <laughs> by social core. media. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I try not to let it, you know, I try to make the creation of my art a separate process than the formatting of the art for social media. Right, um, right, right, right. But of course they will be integrated somehow because when I was really active on DeviantArt, like the stuff that was successful on DeviantArt were the the detailed pieces, like the de- mm. Deviants, the, the users there, they love that. You know, if you made like a piece that you spent like five times longer on than all your other ones, they would notice and they would be like, this is really detailed. This is one of your better pieces. And they really rewarded, uh, you know, that kind of artistry. But on Instagram, that doesn't do as well, you know, the right. because people want to see close up stuff, high contrast, because they're all on their phones, right? So, yeah. and people love to see sketches and process more than anything else on these platforms like, D, um, like Instagram. On DeviantArt, I think because they were all artists, they already kind of had an idea of the process and they were really right. interested in seeing your best possible work. And on Instagram, everybody's like trying to figure out how things work and trying to learn, you know? So if you show like a half finished sketch, that might generate much more interest than like a super detailed piece. Yeah. I've so I've, that. <laughs> yeah. And I've, I've noticed that I put less focus on these finished paintings. Like I still make them, I still, I still put time aside every month to make some digital paintings and it's still very important to me, but I also see more value in my rough pieces and sketches, you know, because that also generates like, and I noticed that I work in a, you know, image, like I prefer a tall image because that also, so those are things that like kind of seep in subconsciously. Um, but it definitely like, I'm lucky. I'm really happy that I had kind of a strong artistic identity before I started on Instagram. Um, because if I had like kind of cultivated that side of me while on Instagram, I think it would have had a bigger impact, but I'm just trying to adapt my existing sort of brand and style and way of working to Instagram. Um, but it's had a huge impact on my career decisions more than anything else. Gotcha. Like it's, it's really impacted my choice to focus on like sharing knowledge and, um, branding myself as somebody who is approachable that like connects with other artists. So th- these are the things that it's really opened up opportunities for me to grow, uh, you know, as a business right. person more than, more than anything else. That makes a lot of sense. When did you join Instagram? What was, um, what was like the first time you you realized that this could be a good tool for you to sort of like hey maybe this is another another avenue because i remember deviantart i i used to i mean i used to post there i i kind of agree uh it's it's kind of lost its flair yeah um i i I don't think social media helped (laughs) no social media killed it for sure pretty much (laughs) yeah um i mean there's art station that is huge but it's more it's more concept art than anything else yeah uh and you know more of like entertainment world uh, and then behance for like designers uh graphics designers uh motion design all that stuff um yeah i wonder i wonder where where it started for you on instagram because I, I i agree it used to be just photos like you would just mm-hmm. share and most <laughs> most of the people i knew would just like here's a photo of my dinner and you know this is how yeah this that's is what i did out. too yeah. <laughs> hanging out with friends and yeah i i like the filter so i always had like <laughs> bad photos on my really bad smartphone and then i put like a crazy filter on it with like the border you know like a fake photo border yeah yeah, yeah. that's what i used it for at first <laughs> yeah, and then the vasco came out and people would yeah. overuse that here's my uh, you know <laughs> Fuji filter or whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, no, I used to post like just random pictures on there and never really my art. And I did it. I just saw it as like a, like a side thing, mm-hmm. um, for a really long time. And then I started noticing 
Well, what really drew me to Instagram is kind of a weird story, but there was an imposter on there. So somebody who pretended to be me and, uh, they posted all my art or like a bunch of it. And it was like super, it was, those posts were really doing really well. You know, people were like, wow, I love this art. And I was like, what? That's a, that person's pretending to be me. Um, and I got them removed from Instagram, but then, uh, I realized like, Hey, this is, uh, my imposter was more successful than I was on Instagram, right? So it was time for me to, like, it was a clear message that people wanted to see art there and not just my terribly right. edited, like, <laughs> vacation pictures. So, yeah. um, and then it really changed everything because I, I, I realized that the whole internet landscape was changing from using Instagram because it's a completely different system than what I yeah. w- had known before. Um, and I, I, I made it my goal to try and like kind of grow my following on there as much as I possibly could because I saw that like the other platforms that I was using like Tumblr and Facebook were like sinking ships basically. They uh, weren't really, uh, were they did, they had low engagement, you know, by comparison. Yeah. And, uh, and I really didn't like seeing people who had a super similar style to me and who had like, uh, or were literally reposting my art doing better than I was on this platform. I felt like a really old person that was like not hip with what the kids <laughs> were doing. So I was like, all right, I really need to learn how this works and gain some control yeah. over this. <laughs> That stuff yeah. can be frustrating when you see your art being plastered all over the place and, yeah. and, and those accounts are like killing it doing it, you know? Yeah. It's one of the most frustrating. I mean, I guess it, go, it comes with territory, but it can be really frustrating. Like, I personally don't mind people sharing my work and I, I, I'm be- I bet you don't, mind, you don't mind that either, but it becomes a problem when you have an account that has half a million followers or something. And they share the work uh, that it's clearly yeah. yours and they don't even credit or they put like a wall of text and hashtags and then at the very bottom that no one even looks at is there there's a credit to an artist it's like uh, that's kind of that's kind of sleazy but the yeah. but the but the credit to the uh the account itself it's like right at right at right at top yeah technically yeah. We credited you you know it's like oh, that's that's sleazy. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy about Instagram because like certain things do really well that are to me like baffling. Um, you know, uh, yeah. you see one thing that kind of, I noticed about Instagram is that like, so I, I give a social media workshop, um, like uh, many years ago, uh, this Dutch organization here, like a sort of organization for graphic designers contacted me and they were like, maybe you could create a workshop about social media. And I was like, okay, well, I need some time, you know, to, to do some research. Um, because I do have a lot of tips and advice for social media, but like, I want to give a proper workshop. So I'm going to, I like dived into the marketing materials, like so read a lot of books about it. And one of the books was, uh, like a Dutch book with a lot of tips for Instagram but it was like for influencers, I think like aspiring influencers. And Mm -hmm. it had all this advice, like, you know, choose one color scheme and use it for everything you post or like pick one brand angle and, you know, like milk pictures of milkshakes and only post that one thing. And that'll do really well. And I was like, that's insane, you know, but then I see that a lot in the artists as well. Like I see that artists who have like one extremely limited, aesthetic, um, do really well. And also there are certain styles that are really popular. So you see like, you know, I've been on the internet. I I sound like such an old lady right now, but I've been (laughs) active on these artist communities for a really long time. You know, since 2003, I've been like on the internet every day, watching all these artists grow. So I know who the first artists were that started doing certain things. But now I see all these copycats of those artists on Instagram right. and they post nothing but like carbon copies, you know, of someone else's style. And Instagram has a very young user base and they don't know that like this artist that they're following is derivative of another artist, you know, but yeah. this, um, this one, uh, like just keeping the same aesthetic and repeating the content a lot does well on Instagram. So I see that it really That's impacts. 
it impacts young artists a lot because they they're not challenged to diversify or to deepen you know what they do um of course you could apply the same criticism to me i get a lot of criticism that i draw the same stuff over and over and and to a certain extent i it, well, it, looking it, at your it's pictures. true but they're colorful, you know. There's there's some blue, there's I mean, some red. I like reds. to draw. I, get the, I like to draw. You know, in, I like to stay in my comfort zone. But I can see that being taken to a really dramatic extreme on right. Instagram a lot. I see very young artists that have incredible skills, but those skills are very derivative, and they're repeating it over and over. Gotcha. And if on DeviantArt, they would have been called out for that, and they would have probably been, you know, pushed to some extent to try something else or to to become more unique and have their own voice. But right. being unique and being different isn't always rewarded on a platform like Instagram because people will follow an account that has nothing but pink or just pictures mm. of milkshakes, you know? Do you ever like get um, sort of like, does it, this, uh, did it stuck in your head that that's something you should maybe do for presentation sake with Instagram or you don't care and just, I mean, uh, I don't see, I don't see your, your account to be, specifically very narrow or, or whatsoever it's very diverse you know you kind of do it kind of seems like you just don't care and, and do whatever you like doing yeah um, well i recently started trying to be more picky about when um which pictures end up next to each other oh, just gotcha. so that i don't have like too much repetition but that's purely because i started my patreon and um my patrons get to see my art before anybody else so they see right. my art like i post my art to patreon and then about a month later i post it online so at the beginning of the month i have a bunch of art that i can kind of like i can be flexible about when i post it and how so then i kind of look at like oh i could do this one on this day and that one on that day but before that i was just posting as i created and yeah it, it, it was very random and messy but i felt like what worked for me was to uh work on my tone of voice so I really try to, you know, um, in my writing style and in my choice of like what kind of content I share and in my way of communicating with people who follow me, I want them to kind of get a sense of who I am um, and that I have an identifiable like tone of voice that you can see in my my social media posts and i i think that's more valuable than an aesthetic because an right. aesthetic is very limiting but having a tone of voice that's like uh you know your personality that like gets people yeah. acquainted with who you are as a person so when i give my social media workshops the first exercise we do like i have people write down a little elevator pitch on what they do like because it's all different kinds of people there's like people in different areas of the creative industry and then they have to sit in a group and read the elevator pitch to each other and then the other people in the group have to tell them like what the tone is that they're getting from you you know right, and they, they can right. choose from words like you know um like business savvy or friendly and open or, you know, sensitive, like they could choose from all those kinds of words. And then I encourage them to try and find ways to like translate that tone into what they're typing and writing and into the whole way of presenting their work so that you feel like you're looking at something that a real person is trying to share with you gotcha. rather than just a picture that you see. Yeah. Customary you're discovering yourself or like your your own voice and how to present yeah. it that that's what that by that by itself is a skill too yeah because it's um you know you, you behave naturally in front of your friends but then once you're facing with social media that's that's like a whole different beast yes sort of figuring out hmm is it the way i'm supposed to behave do i need to do that what am, what am i doing like those are not my friends those are like random people that i've never met you know yeah yeah, exactly. And it's a real, I think there's like a certain kind of like skill to finding a way to communicate that seems authentic. And, um, and on, on the internet, you know, it's hard to find authenticity, which is why it's almost those, impossible. <laughs> yeah. And that's why those algorithms are insane. You know, they're like so strict because if they weren't that strict, you would see nothing but spam and like yeah. junk and like people in MLMs, you know, like multi-level marketing schemes and people trying to sell you stuff that you don't want. And and the reason that they have these algorithms is because they want to filter the authentic content from, from the, the junk. And, um, yeah. 
And that's why I think it's important not to think about having a feed aesthetic, but rather having, um, you know, coming across like a real person, because that's something that like is so hard to cultivate. And if you do that right, then the algorithms will favor what you post. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, what made you go into Patreon route? I mean, you no, know, based on what you say, I mean, you, you, you work with Lego and, uh, you know, big companies that, uh, big animation companies and video games and whatnot. What is, uh, I mean, for most, for most artists, including myself, you know, I, I usually you reach that goal. It's like, hell yeah, I, I kind of made it, you know, this is, this is, this is what I always wanted to do, be with like the big name and, and work for like the big projects and have my name in credits. And, you know, but oftentimes it ends up, ends up with like, I cannot show any of that, <laughs> of that work, yeah. whether I like it or not. I know that feeling. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> But what, what made you kind of switch gears? Because because now it seems that, uh, you, I mean, ob the obvious the obvious result of it is like you're more independent than ever, right? In terms of your choices and um, what kind of clients you want to work with and whether you want to work with clients at all that month or that week, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, I don't know. Like, because I, I personally... I've never, I mean, I've never done Patreon seriously, meaning, um, use it for, okay, this is, this is, this is the, the exact reason what I want to do with Patreon. Right. I, I did that with school. Like I learned, uh, um, I, I've, I've co-founded with my friends, uh, school called, called learn squared. And, uh, and we, you know, we do a lot of like ultra high level professional teaching, like from the best in the industry, you know, we had, uh, J.R. Knast, uh, teaching motion design and, you know, Ash, my friend Ash, who's like one of the best designers out there, you know, teaching classes myself and a bunch of other people like from, you know, Naughty Dog and you name it. Right. Um, and I found like, this is, this is kind of interesting Avenue because like, uh, a it's, it's a business B it's like, it's something I like doing personally. Um, and it kind of also makes you a little bit more independent because it by itself becomes a source of revenue. Right. Yeah. Um, but, but again, like mostly, mostly what, what you were saying with the way you were looking at art, you, obviously you want to make money doing it, but, but you don't do it for money specifically. You do it because you're so passionate about, about doing it. Like if you just followed the money route, you would just pick whatever your parents were suggesting, like, Hey, maybe you can become <laughs> a lawyer or a doctor, you know? And that's sort of like a no brainer. Everyone knows that you, you can make a good money and, or used to not anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, so things are changing dramatically, but, um, yeah, I'm curious, like what made you, what made you go into Patreon route? Uh, I'm pretty sure there's other routes as well, but you know, there's, there's that switch. It's like, okay, I work for clients. Now I'm working for myself. Like, what is that? What is that switch like for you? Um, well, I'm still working for clients. I have to say like, I can't, I can't eliminate that. Um, because I have, my clients are like, my client work is super inspiring for me. Um, right. because it gives me like more structure and direction, but also because of the stuff that we talked about, like le I learned so much from it and I'm inspired sure. to push past my boundaries with client work. So I really couldn't live without it, but it was becoming too much. Um, I mm. spent a couple of years really doing like a lot of client work. Um, and I noticed that I was getting less and less time for my own work and, and the per, my personal work that I was making was really suffering under the fact that I just didn't have that much time that whenever I did have time for my own art, that it was like a sort of burned out feeling. And I was only painting to relax, but not to challenge mm. myself anymore. And the image that I project to the outside world, you know, is my personal work. Like people think that that's all that I make. So I, I felt like I wasn't really showing my best self and right. I had totally lost touch with, um, my habit of, uh, like practicing. So I wasn't doing much sketching or studies anymore. It was all just like either client work or trying to make like detailed digital painting so that I would have, you know, something to show for the time that I put in. And it was starting to get kind of like out of balance. And I noticed that I was getting more and more frustrated with my client work. So when I, when it was time to sit down and start my day, I would sometimes be so annoyed by some tiny detail that I found it hard to maintain focus, you know? Right. Um, 
I realized at some point I was like, because I usually had to put on a podcast in order to like have something to listen to while I was drawing. Um, and I spent like, I think it was one day that I spent like so long looking for a podcast and nothing was right and nothing felt right. And I realized that it wasn't the podcast wasn't the problem. I just didn't want to start, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> That was, it became too much. And, uh, and I realized that I really had to tone it down. Cause I was like, I had totally lost touch with my personal creativity. And, um, and I realized that a Patreon could, it could give me like some kind of basis, like, um, a commitment because I found right. it hard to commit to my personal art. Um, like another thing is that as, as I've, I've been a freelancer for 10 years now. And in the beginning I was just kind of winging it. I had like, a, I had like a walk-in closet that had like a desk in it. And that's where I just sat on my laptop and drew, you know, mm. it was super easy going and I kind of went with the flow, but over those 10 years, my work got more and more and more complicated. So in the beginning I was making money from client work and maybe some commissions, but now I'm making money from like I'm generating income from book sales, merchandise sales, print sales. Um, I also like have the client work. I do workshops. The workshops was like a big thing that went in because it was like a huge, like I generated a lot of workshop material and then right. traveled a lot for that. And then I started doing events as well, like going to big events and my, like the different sources of income and the different types of work had become so much. And I had to do so much switching between different kind of like mental states that I found that like, you know, personal work had just totally disappeared from mm. my list of priorities. And, and I found that when I did have time, I would rather work on my workshop content or like book my flight for the, for next month's workshop or work on promoting an event that I was going to than actually creating art. Right. So I realized that the only thing that would keep me motivated to keep creating art was to make a commitment to it and starting a Patreon felt like a good commitment because then people were literally paying to see me create my own art. So <laughs> right. I, I, I would have to force myself. Like I, I would feel so awful not doing that. You know what I mean? Yeah, so like course, you said, you have friends that approach their personal work, like client work. That's sort of how I, I tried to see my patrons as my clients. And I try to make like, I have a, a schedule for how I approach creating the content for Patreon, um, certain like a goal for how much art I want to create. And I have time set aside every month to work on it, but it's not, um, the whole month. It's like part of the month. And then the other part right. is still for client work or for workshops or whatever. That's interesting. Yeah. So you're, you, you, you found yourself more of like, okay, I need a structure in order to do this, uh, there's like so many, so many other things, uh, other responsibilities that kind of drain the energy enough for you to not have that ability to like, Hey, I need that, yeah. that focus and I need that energy and yeah, inspiration and, to do And honestly, work. sometimes I wanted to do the, the organizational stuff more than drawing. Right. Like drawing is something that you have to get into it. Like you have to get started and then you have to get into that flow. And then once, and for me, once I'm in it, it's hard to get out of it again, right. but updating a spreadsheet or booking a flight ticket or emailing people is more small, manageable, bite-sized things that I right. can do. And I found you myself you actually, need, you know, you don't need to flow to do that. <laughs> yeah. And I felt drawn to it. So I was like, right. I have a whole week to create art. And then I spent the whole week just like doing secretary type work for myself. <laughs> You know, I was like, no, this is definitely not a good sign. Like something's out of balance. I used to do that stuff really purely out of my own motivation, but that's changed a lot now that I'm an old lady. I, my motivations have changed. So old. We're so old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, that makes, that absolutely makes sense. I, I, it might be, don't you think it might be stemming from, from the fact that, you know, over time, you know, the, the kind of the older we get the more kind of responsible we become about our lives. And, yeah. you know, you have to look at, at things like you can't be just loosey goosey, like, oh, I'm just going to, you know, paint and that's, uh, let's yeah. see what happens. 
you know once you once you start a family that's 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 even more difficult once you have kids yeah. it's like no i you know i, I have to provide there's no yeah. other way um but what, what can quickly what can quickly happen is you, you're gonna run yourself in that corner where you have responsibilities only and yeah. not or not even no, no time but after all all responsibilities are taken care of you kind of find yourself without almost no energy right to uh with no energy to to do anything that you would want to do just out truly out of passion that you yeah. might have had like that's what that's kind of that's kind of what you what got you to the dance and now you're like too tired to dance you know yeah exactly that it just becomes also like you get a short-term satisfaction from like just finishing tasks right like at least I know a lot of people hate doing like small tasks in the day, like, I don't know, clearing out your dishwasher and putting the dishes in. Those are like <laughs> stupid tasks, but they make me feel in the short term, like I did something, you know? Right. And, and for me, that became a distraction from like the more long term satisfaction things, like making some drawings for my own, to build my skills and to get into new creative projects for myself is something that like, isn't immediately rewarding and it's not right. you can't immediately put a value on it like with client work and say like all right i made this much money this week you know it's it's more like uh you know something you do for yourself it's a different part of you that you connect with and i that's why for me it's really important to plan it in to just be like all right i i have to do it today because as as a very responsible 34 year old i feel more drawn to just getting my day in order and um, right preparing for next week or whatever. So it's, I don't know. I, it sounds really lame because I know that if I had heard this, like if my 18 year old self was hearing me say this, I would be like, what the hell? <laughs> What's wrong what happened that? to me? <laughs> you know, but it, it did happen that way. You know, like everything kind of yeah. changed. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting because like when you, when you, when we all started, uh, I mean, yourself myself and even even people who are listening to this or, or artists who are starting now you start with this notion it's like oh like it's all about passion it's all about you know i love doing this stuff and a lot of it prevails but but yeah like that that's kind of like the reality of life and responsibilities all of those things kick in and yeah, yeah it's like finding that balance of like not just getting not getting too overwhelmed with responsibilities and sometimes treating treating like personal art as business where you know what unless i structure it properly and and have like vision for it and this is what i need to do and there's a schedule and then there is a there is a built-in reward that that kind of makes me the built-in reward that makes me pick that over picking client work for instance um that's where it's where it just sometimes needs to happen i, I feel like yeah yeah it's true yeah yeah it's very hard to balance because like I think in most of us to the core, we, we, we don't like look at monetary value of the things we do, creative things we do. Cause like you, you didn't go to become an artist to make money. You, 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 you dropped an idea of picking a career path of a typical work where you, you do it for money to do something that you love instead, you know? And, uh, yeah, it's like, it's like it's that, that weird sort of st like fighting the stigma of like, Hmm, you know, should I look at it as a business or not? You know, and what does it mean? And how do I, how do I openly talk about that idea with, with, with the audience that might have a completely different perspective of what art is? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's difficult. Do you have like any opinion on, do you feel like that's, that's a challenge, challenge, a challenge for you as well, mm -hmm. where you look at the work you do and the presentation and all of those things and and you sometimes wish like oh, i wish i was like 18 and completely you know oblivious to all of the all, all the other things and yeah I, I, I think when i was like younger i had more like drive from within so i did stuff like just because you know right I yeah sometimes think back on how i was then and i'm like what was i thinking like i, just, <laughs> I don't remember I, I was very obsessive. Like I, I was really obsessed with, 
um, like Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Harry Potter, The Matrix, like really obsessed with The Matrix. Like my friends made fun of me because they were like, this girl is obsessed. Like I would always talk about The Matrix all the time. When you watched watched Matrix, did you go out and like pretend everything is Matrix? (laughs) (laughs) No, I was like, I would go onto the internet and read like theories on the deeper meaning. I had a book that was like, uh, different philosophers giving their theories and really like comparing the matrix to Plato's cave and all these things. So I was like one of those intellectual nerds. And, um, and I, uh, when I look at my old art as well, like I just had, when I look at it out, it, it cracks me up. Like I still laugh so hard when I look at my own work and sometimes I put it on the internet and then people are like, why are you so 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 mean about your old work like you're putting artists down who are beginners and i'm like no no no, that's not what i'm trying to do like i just genuinely think that like my mindset was funny you know because i i was really into the powerpuff girls i love the powerpuff girls um i was drawing on old school stuff (laughs) i was drawing on a powerpuff girl a cocky board which is like a long story but it's like an online drawing board with powerpuff girl theme And I also was really into Star Wars and I was really into Art Nouveau. And there was like an Art Nouveau style outfit in Star Wars Episode 2 where Padme is wearing like a a yellow dress that looks like uh, like just a classic Art Nouveau style dress. But then like adapted to the Star Wars universe. And I loved that dress. I loved Art Nouveau. I loved the Powerpuff Girls. So I drew a Powerpuff Girl wearing Padme's dress. You know, and I was like, this is what I want to do. And I didn't think about it. I didn't think about like whether that was cool or why I was drawing it or what I was trying to achieve or gain. It was purely an expression of liking it, you know. And the funniest part is that last year I met Ian McCaig and I showed him the Powerpuff Girl Padme and he was like, oh, (laughs) (laughs) but he was really nice about it. Um, He's the designer of Padme. Um, Yeah. Ian is a, is a great guy. He's um, awesome. He's very chill and laid back. But very the, chill. But now when I draw, I'm really thinking a lot about like, what do I have to gain from this? Like, what am I learning from it? How is it pushing me forward? And, you know, is it a waste of my time or not? And back then, I just did stuff like without any embarrassment or even a second thought as to whether it was a good way to spend my time because I wasn't, I didn't think that time was money back then. And that's the main thing I've learned since becoming a freelancer is like time is money. So everything that you do needs to have like, if it's within work hours, even if it's outside of work hours, it should be something that you do to relax so that you can work again, you know? And I'm, I'm thinking about the value of how I spend my time And I'm happier now than I've ever been. So like, I feel a lot better when I was 18. I wasn't like the happiest teenager and I felt very like overwhelmed by the world and I didn't understand how the world works. And now I understand how the world works and I feel a high level of control and like, I, I feel at peace with a lot of things. Like, I feel like I've found my place in the world, but I've lost that sense that like, it doesn't matter how I spend my time. So now I'm always thinking about, is this... Good right. <clears throat> the trade of, of knowing and not knowing. Exactly. Um, I mean, yeah. as a teenager, I just didn't care. I, I drew on these boards that the image resolution was 300 by 300 pixels. And I was like, it's a cool look. It's pixely. And I didn't even <laughs> know what print resolution meant. So I found out later that I could never print them out at a high resolution. <laughs> now I could never draw. Like when I draw an image that is like that can't be blown up to poster size, I feel like it's it's bad, you know. And when yeah. I draw fan art, I'm like, this is uh, I could never sell prints of any of this, you know. So that's Some people do. <laughs> Some people do, and I'm not against that, but I just, I don't want to do it for myself and I don't want to get in trouble, but like, it just feels like a lot, like what I spent all my time doing now, I think like, is that a responsible way to spend my time? Right. Yeah. Um, time is the only, the only currency that we all share that is equal to all of us, you know? Yeah. Like you can have more money, you can have less money, you, you know, there's other trades that that people have more or less, but everyone is equal when it comes to time. There's a finite amount of it that we can share. Yeah, it makes you, like over time, you know, like the more experience you get and the more you live, you kind of start to appreciate how much time means to you versus what you get out of it. And then you base your decision 
because it is a finite thing it's a ticking clock and right. eventually yeah you, you like you need to realize that and and accept it but once you do then then it's so much easier to make those choices like okay you know in my ideal day this is what i want to do and and maybe those other things that i used to think that were cool but maybe a little bit too time consuming maybe they're not the wisest uh thing to do anymore yeah um yeah i think what you said about being like lucy and then sort of like a little careless and now kind of knowing what you do and being more focused and organized i think that's a that's sort of like another trade-off where i i feel when i look at I look at myself back in the days it's like i almost i almost sometimes wish i had like this kind of weird approach to like careless uh approach to art but then on, on the other hand like just just begrudging the idea of like rediscovering everything from scratch and and it's like I, I enjoy process of discovery, but I don't enjoy process of like forgetting and then trying to remember what did I just forget, you know? Yeah. Uh, I'd much rather discover new things instead and 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 try to learn uh what those are and how how they can kind of like stack and layer on top of everything that I've that I've done so far. Yeah. It's good to have a jumping off point as well. Like if you have a yeah. basis, you know, where like some kind of and that's what I looping back to what I said about that first year in college where I felt like my legs were cut off creatively, creatively. Yeah. It's like you want to have like some basis that that gives you like a place to move out from, you know, because there's like so much inspiration and so many ideas and techniques that exist that you could integrate. But if you don't have any idea, you know, what your starting point is, then it's hard to fit that into a bigger picture. You just become kind of like a loose projectile, like checking everything out. And for me, like, what I learned about drawing, like uh, when I was 15 and I first started drawing in Photoshop, I first started drawing digitally, that is still the basis for how I work, you know, but I'll, I'll move out from there and kind of try to grow from there or evolve from there. But that those were formative years and those formative yeah. years are really important to like keep as a starting point for like your creative journey because if you if you're just kind of free floating and trying random stuff then it, i think it's hard to like figure out what what's useful for you and what's not right right yeah 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 it, it's like a basis that you need creatively yeah having that starting point to know like at least it's, it it feels like all right i have i have my feet are on the ground i'm not I'm not falling. You know? Yeah. Uh, I can, I can start looking around yeah. instead of looking like at your art, artistic identity, you know, like you can want to yeah. change and grow as an artist, but you're starting somewhere. You need to know what that identity is, I think. And right. I think for a lot of people that artistic identity starts at a really early stage. And, and that's why I hate gatekeeping. That's why I hate it when teachers are like, you shouldn't draw anime and manga or like, you know, even like people who think that furries are awful like i'm not a fan of furries but let them be you know like right um for that's each own, for each of their own <clears throat> as yeah they say. and for some yeah. people that's where they started you know and that's yeah. what sparked their creativity and that's where their creative journeys began and and it's okay mm -hmm. like if you if you shame people like, try to gatekeep what what is and isn't good then you kind of like knock their feet out from under them and then it's like where do they go from there you know that's also what i love about the internet you have all these like super established and talented artists in their 30s and then sometimes they share their work from when they were just starting to draw and it's like just really bad sailor moon fan art and stuff or like furries and it's just yeah. so funny to see. Like, we all came <laughs> from there you know we all started drawing like silly things when we were kids and that that's yeah. that's part of it one of the things i like about current days is just just the fact how well we are connected and and how how much openness there is because of that because like you realize that some of your personal childhood heroes are as weird as you like they had yeah. the, the past where they drew sailor moon that everyone else would tell you that's like oh never do that because this is like some weird shit you know and you're never gonna get work from that and it's like oh not necessarily anymore you know yeah. like all of those things are kind of changing and the freedom of expression the idea that you can resonate with people and find like-minded crowd that will follow you because the way you are because the way that they feel about themselves as well you know you don't have to be specifically this or specifically that specifically this style obviously those are the the things it's like marvel movies right 
um, Marvel movies, the, the, the reason why they are the way they are. And, you know, actually right before, I mean, not right before, but last week I had a podcast with Andy Park, who, was, uh, who is the head of uh, visual development. And, you know, we kind of discussed this. And uh, one, of, one of the things that Marvel does really well is that they, they take measured uh, risks who would think that Guardians of the Galaxy, one of the most obscure elements of, of entire MCU, would become probably one of the best series that they ever made, you know? Like, it's such a fascinating world with fascinating characters, but, like, when you read comic books, like, they were never the most popular comic books to begin with, you know? Same with Ant-Man. Like, Ant-Man? What? A guy turning into Ant? Growing and getting smaller? Like, is that a right idea for a movie? You know, but but they made it work. You know. Yeah. Um. So, but but yeah, like there there is there is a notion that there, you know, if you follow a certain formula, there's you're gonna be more popular. But there, but but the opposite is true as well. You could be completely yourself, and and that's gonna gain you a crowd that that just appreciated because the way you are, you know, because like how yeah. how you present yourself. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, and sometimes like your moment. You know, like sometimes whatever you make isn't understood at the time that you make it. But right. then later on, you find your people, you know, creatively. That's a fair point, yeah. Yeah, so it's sort of like as long as you try to like stay true to what you really want to do and what really excites you and interests you creatively while still taking the necessary steps, you know, obviously to adapt to the creative industry if you want to work in it. But if you keep like a sort of authenticity to what you want to do, then that'll you know then the chance of you finding people who get it and get what you like and get your vision is, is bigger and there are a lot of like really amazing creators like filmmakers animators storytellers who right. weren't understood in their time but the stuff was picked up later and then it was appreciated you know yeah. or who took a risk and made something Something unexpected. I always think the the Lion King is a really funny example because it's like at the time, I don't know if you know this. I think it's like a lot of people already know this, but um, when Lion, the Lion King was in production, actually the big movie at the time was Pocahontas that they were making. So they were putting all their resources and time into Pocahontas. And because of that, like the production of Lion King was really like laid back and spontaneous. Like they had much more creative freedom and space yeah. to do what they wanted. And then Lion King ended up being like insanely popular and to bring it back to an earlier theme, like spawned the community of furries, you know, like it's so huge. <laughs> the cultural impact of the Lion King is massive. And no one could have seen that coming because they were just having fun, you know, and just making something, uh, something spontaneous. And, and did you, did you ever talk with Aaron Blaze before? No, I don't he's, think I have. He's one of the animators on the, um, yeah, I love his animations. Cause I used yeah. to, I saw his ad come by a lot on Facebook because he has like an animation course and it has yep. like an animated hippo that's like dancing. Yep. I love that. Every time I saw it, I would watch the whole thing. <laughs> One of my favorite people. Yeah, we, we were just we were just talking about it. Like you could you could check it out if you want later. But um, we're you, you know I was I was surprised because he because he was on the on the on the Lion King and then then they did Mulan and they had like this whole the streak of like those awesome movies that yeah. that they were producing and like when he when he said you know like there was only like 5 or 10 of us working in the studio and obviously like Disney had this this giant team of of animators that would then take and and clean like a cleanup crew so they would take all of the frames that they drew because the way the way they used to draw is like they would draw an animation, but they would be very loose about it. Like they wouldn't be super perfect in terms of how they draw lines. They were just like, like as you said, like we're just we're just having fun. But then they would have this giant crew that would just go by and frame by frame redraw everything, so it's like almost pixel perfect. Yeah. And it's what made the 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 Disney movies back then, the Disney animation, to be so like standing out so much because it was just so perfectly done. But it also became like the one of the things that kind of uh, kind of doomed the whole production as well, because how many people had to be involved and how much it costs to make it happen, and then like 
once you introduce schedule and the, the, the schedule of release and you want to keep those people employed all the time. So now you have to produce on a regular basis and kind of like that's where it calls kind of started collapsing. But yeah, yeah, it's interesting what you said. Yeah, that's that, that's that's true. Um, I kind of it's kind of funny how how small the world is. Also, it's just like, <laughs> all right. Yeah, I kind of I kind of dabbled in that in that topic as well. And yeah, I mentioned the name and like, oh, yeah, I saw him <laughs> I saw his work <laughs> through like a little, little, little dancing hippo. Um, yeah, it's a. It's a, it's a big and the small small world. As I said before we started, like, you know, I start like Instagram is, is such a gi- such a giant discovery, almost like a pr- playground for me because for the longest time I used to I used to look at at art that is mostly entertainment related, you know, what it would be a video game characters character design, but you know that's that's one of the things as well. Like you discover artists in those environments that you've never heard about because they've never got their work released. Mm -hmm. and you've never seen this you know and instagram is sort of like this place where you can now like rediscover artists that you've never heard about or you know maybe maybe seen the work on pinterest or something but but never got to like actually discover them uh like or know know about them a little better like the most frustrating part about some of those sharing platforms is like you have someone's art and then like who who made that there's no credit yeah and, it's, and then there's like copycats as you said yeah uh, I, I think beeple is the perfect example of that like beeple is you know he made every days he's he's a so-called ceo of every days so let's let's put it yeah. that way <laughs> <laughs> and then you have those spawns of every days that kind of like followed his formula and yeah. literally copying him at this point you know it's like ah oh, fuck it i'm just gonna copy <laughs> yeah yeah you it's know? weird like the i think the internet has made I don't know, has brought a lot of weird things about human nature to light, right. you know, like humans, people are smart. Like they look at what works and they just, they'll be like, I'll figure out a way to make it work for me. And, yeah. and, um, that, you know, what, something that I find so fascinating, you know, on YouTube, it's like a, a really weird topic, but you know, um, was a, Elsa gate. Do you know about Elsa gate? No. It's no, really no, weird. no, wait. I think I've heard about it. <laughs> yeah, it's something it's like, nefarious. <laughs> it's like it's like all these weird movies. I don't know if it's still a thing. It was a couple years ago, but um, like all these weird movies that feature Elsa and Spider Man and like popular yeah, characters. Yeah, I've heard about it. Yeah, but they do all this weird stuff. The movies don't make any sense. And it was advertised to kids. That's one of the yeah. reasons why why yeah. YouTube changed the policy because it was just like, oh, this this is kind of like border borderline pedophile kind yeah, of. Yeah, there was a deal. lot of inappropriate stuff happening, but most of it was completely random. Like most of it yeah. was like just there's a lot of like physical humor like a lot of falling and i don't know i haven't seen enough of it but it what it is is like it grew from the algorithm you know what i mean and somewhere out there there's some weird studio or some group of people that like thought like well let's let's try to work this algorithm and just yeah, make play something that game. completely <laughs> random and then it loses like the substance but it still has enough ele- identifying elements to make yeah. it work and and i feel like oh, that happens a lot now on the internet you know you get a lot of people who like are looking at what works and then they'll just kind of imitate it and you have like bots that do that but you have also just genuine people who are like Hey, that artist does a cool thing. I'm just going to do the exact same thing and then things are going to work for me. And yeah. And, and people are very like like the internet shows how how much observation and adaptability there is, but that it's like um not always substantial. So that that always that that fascinates me. Like um accounts or like content that has lost the original intent but still follows the form i hope that there's going to be like a cool like analytical deep dive documentary into elsa gate sometime that would be interesting that would be fun yeah. <laughs> well, it probably censored a lot but yeah those whoever did that I, I mean i haven't delved enough but it's one of those things where you can you know you, you, as you said you, you you play with the algorithm it's like yeah. okay you know this is like the most uh searched phrase let's use that and let's create something yeah. that the problem was is it was that it was um 
deemed appropriate to kids. Yeah, you and, have a lot of that creepy stuff too. Like that's, yeah, and not filtered. That, that sort of stuff like finds its way. It's like the underbelly of the internet that that comes up sometimes, and that that's always really horrifying. But I know yeah. that um, a, a friend of mine from from Utrecht School of the Arts that studied animation, he does like. Um, he, does, he makes like really nice quality animations for young children. Um, it's called like Adventures of Babu and it's a mm -hmm. little monkey and it's really good. Like he, he, his goal is to make like really nice animations for young kids and like well-written. Um, but he sort of like, before he started making them, he was looking at like what kind of animations are popular with little kids. And a lot of it is junk, you know, which is why he wanted yeah. to bring quality a lot of it was really random and then you look yeah. in the comments and all the comments are like just keyboard smash comments you know they're just like random letters or just like blah, 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 you know like <laughs> repeating and he was like listen lois look at these comments you know what these comments are and i was like what what is this he was like it's the babies the babies watch the videos yeah. and then they, they leave they a click. comment and they don't they... know how to type <laughs> yeah and then they just like ah, yeah i have this with my kid yeah <laughs> and so like there's a huge part of youtube that's just like what kids watch and and there's totally different rules there you know like what kind of stuff excites the kids and who's going to comment you know what i mean and he he did a lot of research into that and now he has like that channel that's doing really well and it's yeah, really really awesome. cool animation but it's funny to see how like these strange patterns of behavior uh, sort of emerge from these platforms yeah, you know, like one of the most fascinating things that it kind of plays to what you're saying is um, uh, streaming, like the the streamers on on Twitch, and there's almost like a I, I don't I don't I mean I don't know it's a plague, but but it started started to happen more recently where you have bots, oh yeah, like re replaying the game, but it, but not really engaging in live comments, and then you have like a bot that it would like reply to comments that's more like an AI driven thing. Yeah, and uh, and it's like that 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 aspect is like fascinating because like some of those streams become really huge. I think it was um, the the new game that Riot Games is making, the Valorant, uh, that I had an issue with that where there, like the the most watched stream was an actual bot. It wasn't even streaming. It was just like a, a replay and then a, you know whatever, and the bot basically running the stream. Um, and that's that's kind of like fascinating too and it's kind of like nefarious in a way because it's like okay this whoever whoever designed the stream to be the way it is like figured out the way to play the algorithm and like play into it and and reap reap the benefits and then sort of like stifling the progress of everyone else it's like yeah it's it's very interesting yeah, yeah it is interesting my, I, have, I have a little brother um, technically he's my half brother. Uh, my, my parents divorced my dad right. re remarried. So, uh, and my brother, he's nine, his name's Aiden and he's on the internet like all the time. And it's so yeah. hilarious to see what he does. You know, he like, uh, he, he plays Fortnite a lot and he plays like Roblox and all these like weird online games. <laughs> and it just made me realize like seeing him like on the internet doing these things makes me realize like how much of the internet is just like is eight year olds <laughs> right, <laughs> it's, like yeah. little kids um like sharing stuff and like on tiktok you know like those those platforms it's it's so and they they don't really i think these young kids they're very different than from when we were young and we like got on the internet and we were like yeah. oh my god there's people in a chat room like these kids are completely desensitized to like all the input that they're getting you know what i mean and it's like they're they're used to like a constant flow of like random interactions and maybe they don't even care whether it's a bot or not you know they just right. they just there's so, it's like a huge playground and they're just running around you know and i remember when i was like discovering the internet i would like type in a search term on yahoo search and i'd be like oh my god so many results i was really into hansen the band is very embarrassing uh, i would type hansen and i'd be like so many pictures of hansen you know it was all very picture PG. would take like two hours to load yeah. Yeah. And there would be like chat rooms on, on, on websites that were just like a random chat room. And then you'd right. go in there and be like, Hey guys, ASL, remember ASL? Yeah. Everything yeah. was so like 
super simple back then. And now the internet is like a barrage of like when I watch Aiden like play, he like plays Fortnite. And then at the same time, he has like a YouTube video on with like a streamer also playing Fortnite and then really loud EDM music. And then he also has a <laughs> smartphone. And at the same time, he's like on a headset with his friends and it's just, it's pure insanity. <laughs> It's just different frequency yeah, yeah. Kids these days um yeah how how well they adapt you know I, I i see it with my daughter like she when she takes ipad she operates as like wow, yeah. i know it really well and it's like well you're just five-year-old like what's going on you know yeah, yeah i gave aiden my, my ipad to try procreate and he like he got it within it like, up right away instantly yeah. understood it yeah 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 fascinating yeah kids they're they're <laughs> i mean they have a completely different frequency of things um than we used to you know i mean we we both lived through the age of rotary phones for fuck's sake you know (laughs) (laughs) you remember when you want to call your friends and um and uh Oh, he's not home, so I don't know where he is. <laughs> yeah, know? that that idea like <laughs> weirds me out now. Like that somebody it, that you wouldn't know where somebody is, but right. like back yeah. in the day, yeah. And also like we were when we did finally have internet when I was like eleven, um, we were only allowed to use it for one hour a week. Yeah, because it was dial up, and my parents were like too cheap to let us. <laughs> let us be on the internet for longer yeah, you wouldn't want to get those thousand dollar bills you know <laughs> yeah imagine having only imagine having only one hour of internet a week like yeah. i think i think i would be but the internet is like for me had a really positive effect like it's really created like a community yeah. for me you know a place where i could really connect with people because if i if i hadn't have had that and was only like you know limited to my classmates and my immediate environment i don't think i would have ever found like something that really worked for me um yeah so having like DeviantArt and having those, you know, Powerpuff Girl or khaki boards and stuff like that made a huge difference for me because I, it just those people kind of got it. You know, they got something that like other people around me didn't understand. So I really feel like it's for me mostly a positive development. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Look, I have millions of questions and I could just go on and on and on. Right. I mean, we've been talking for over two hours. Oh, damn, and, uh, it's already so dark yeah, outside. I just, I just noticed it's dark outside. <laughs> I, don't wanna, I know you want to have your evenings free, so I don't want to keep you yeah. up for too long. I still need uh, I to think, go for a run or something, but I don't know. Well, there you go. So, um, yeah, I think I think it's, I mean, we've covered so many grounds. I think it's a, it's a good moment to sort of like, you know, maybe stop here and leave the rest for next time if, 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 when it happens or if it happens, if you'll be interested, obviously. Um, yeah, but it was fascinating to get to know you a little better. Uh, you know, I've, I've kind of like randomly discovered you. I've been following your your work for a while. And it's like, okay, yeah, maybe maybe you know, I want to I want to check I want to check out what's going on. You know, because um, because for to me again, it's like fascinating to kind of the the, the 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 discovery element of it. You know, um, I used to dabble mostly in, in, in talking with 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 peers that are in the same kind of field that I am, but. But I feel like I felt like there's a point where it becomes limiting, you know, it's almost like, you know, posing a challenge, like, let me let me get out of the mold in terms of conversation. Um, so, yeah, fascinating, fascinating for sure. I really appreciate you finding time to do this as well. I really do. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, a lot easier now. I have to be honest. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I'm here anyway. So, um, no, but this, this, these kind of conversations are really great for me because they like, you know, it's a distraction from what's going on, but it also like, you know, it's nice to like connect because that's something I've really been missing. Cause like the, all the events and workshops got canceled yeah. and that's what I really love about giving workshops and attending these events. It's like, being able to connect with other creative people and talk about like these topics and not just about art and the industry, but also just like about creativity in general, you know? And I think now is is a really important time to like be connecting and talking about it. And then also it's really cool that it's going to be available to other people. Cause I know that I've been listening to more podcasts than ever now. So (laughs) yeah, that's the fun part. Yeah. To me, it's uh, yeah again, um, having a conversation with artists, like not being able to meet with them, that's one thing, but just like, you know, um, sometimes, sometimes it's just easier to hop on, on Skype and just chat 
yeah. rather than like, hey, let's meet. Like, I don't know you. What, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> or True. like, you're you're across, you know, the globe and completely somewhere else, and it's impossible unless you have a workshop. Which I think this year, I don't think any any workshops or big gatherings is going to happen at all. I, I mean, don't think so either. I'm really bummed about it, but yeah. I really think that it's the better. I think that's the last thing that's going to come back. Like I think schools, they're already looking at opening schools here for the young kids, like the they really young do. kids. <laughs> yeah, parents are going crazy. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah and uh, they, they, I think they're going to try and open things bit by bit. But I think the very last thing that will come back is the big events, and that's right. it's a bummer because those those events are like so such a big part of like my social life in the artist community yeah but um more i i hope that because playgrounds last week had the online version and they also have one coming up later this month on mm -hmm. the 30th and I, I hope that other organizations follow suit and try to find ways to like make online versions because it really is like it's really fun to see all yeah. those messages come by in the discord and see like all these um all these different people speaking and like a continuous stream of inspiration I hope I hope that more uh, more events will will find a translation into an online version. Yeah, I, I mean there might be some technologies in work we don't know about. You know, when two thousand eight yeah. crash happened, we we go to Uber and Postmates and Instacart and all of those like yeah. services that came out of it, and that might be a moment where a complete a lieu of completely new services that we we never imagined would be so useful for us gonna start from so yeah always looking at the positives of how yeah. things are developed nothing is sure. ever only good or bad yeah yeah there is always yeah. uh everything is not black and white just 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 uh different shades of gray and yes. and then colors you know there's yeah. a lot of things we artists um, know everything about that <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly well thanks so much for for spending this time with me on the podcast that was fun um yeah. And is there is there anything you would want to plug? Is there any like workshops you're working on right now or develop like any developments you have in, in place? Uh, obviously, your social media handles, all of those things. Um, yeah, well, I guess the, the main thing is, well, you can find me on Instagram at, at Lois VB. Um, mm -hmm. And and I'm on Patreon as well. And um, and I'm really excited about my Patreon because I this uh, this month I started um, coming up with like new ideas for paintings that are kind of like dreamscape type paintings. And then I do um, three thumbnails for for the concept and then I post it on my Patreon and then I'm getting feedback from my patrons on like which ones they like the most and which ones they want to see developed. And that's cool. Yeah, like in in the because I've had Patreon for three months now, and then the first couple months it was like just making art, just getting back into the flow, and now I'm like super full of ideas, and I'm like I have all these new creative projects that I want to get started on, and I'm feeling like the urge to step out of my comfort zone and learn new yeah. stuff. So, uh, so Patreon's lots of fun, and I always have to plug it, of course. So you can find me on Patreon. Um, it's L O I S S H. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, go there and and uh, click join. Uh, you gotta need to do that. Uh, I only have one tier, and awesome. it's just five dollars, so it's simple. Yeah, you yeah know, it's Ford, not too Ford, complicated. Ford used to okay. say, you know, clients all. Uh, I'm gonna paraphrase, but yeah, like clients will want the cars in all the color, in all the colors, as long as they're all black. You know, <laughs> uh, like limiting limiting choices sometimes is the best. Yeah, yeah. abundance of choices uh, makes no decision. Like makes you make yeah. no decision. So. <laughs> that makes absolute sense cool yeah. um let's wrap it up here thanks uh thanks everyone for listening obviously if you enjoy the show uh you can subscribe like if you don't if you don't like to do that you don't have to <laughs> i just do i just do my thing uh usually do those shows and it's just fun uh yeah until the next time take care guys cool that's it we All did right. it